Dark Recollections, Adrian's Undead Diary, Book One, Volume One, written by Chris Philbrook, narrated by James Foster. September 2010 September 21st It's pretty fucking cold out tonight. The big-ass plastic thermometer on the tree outside says it's 35 degrees Fahrenheit out tonight. I'm glad I figured out where the emergency generator is here. Otherwise, I'd be freezing my balls off now. Despite the fact that this place was kind of a bitch to clear out, I'm glad I did it. It's got everything I need to survive for a long time. I don't even really know where to start. It's, uh, Tuesday today. At least I know what day it is. Someone in the main office building was wise enough to buy their calendar early this year, so it'll be easy for me to keep track of the days until the end of next year. After that, I guess I'll have to use some of the graph paper and make my own calendar. That's being pretty optimistic, though. The way the last few months have been, I'll be goddamn lucky to make Christmas, let alone next Christmas. I decided to start writing this mainly to keep track of my daily activities and to have a way to purge my nugget. Frankly, I talk to myself way too goddamn much to be mentally healthy, and I was always told that writing a journal helped, so let's call this my journal. Thank God for spell check. I also realize that now is not the best time to be writing. I'm using up some of my gasoline to run the generator, which is basically a waste, and honestly, having any lights on at night draws them in. Moths to a flame, as the old saying goes. But I can't sleep, and I've been meaning to do this for a long time now. Having the electricity back has set a fire under my ass to do this. My name is Adrian Ring. I lived what I would now call as only a moderately successful life. I was happy, but I had pretty low standards. I had a girlfriend. I had a small condo downtown. I still have my cat, Score. And I have thus far avoided being eaten by the undead. Surprise! There's the twist in the story. I fucking love horror movies. Like, seriously. I watched well over a thousand of them, and always used to plot and plan should zombies ever rise from the dead and take over the world. Irony in all that is that when the shit hit the fan, it happened so fast that any kind of plan would have been almost impossible to execute. I was at work the night it started. I used to work third shift at a private school as a dorm supervisor. It was out of the way up in the hills outside of downtown, and only had about a hundred students. Over a hundred thousand a year to attend. Very elite, very snooty, and basically the best job you could ask for. I had nine-hour shifts where I basically just made sure the kids didn't run away and had their needs taken care of. Most nights I would do maybe an hour of work. I spent the rest of the time fucking around online looking at stupid videos and screwing around on the big old F-book. God, I wish I could update my status right now. Something really witty like, hasn't been eaten yet, so is pretty stoked. Or maybe something like, wishes he grabbed more bullets when he raided the gun store in town. I don't know, something cool. Anyway, I was at work when it all hit. Working nights meant I was totally alone, aside from the three other overnights and the sleeping kids. So when I checked the news websites and saw the few updates about zombie hoaxes, I laughed. After a few hours, more and more popped up on other websites, but I didn't take it too seriously. After all, Halloween was coming up soon. I figured it was some kind of stunt to promote a new movie or TV show. It wasn't until the morning when half the day shift people didn't show that I really realized something was up. I went home as I normally do, and nothing seemed to miss. I called my girlfriend on the short drive home, and we chatted. I asked her about it, and she basically said she thought it was a hoax or some stunt. She was still half asleep, though, so who knows what she really saw or heard on TV. Plus, she was getting ready for work herself. She was gone by the time I got home, and I never saw her again. I think she was killed at work, or maybe on the drive home from work. I'll never know. The cities are far too dangerous for me to attempt to go to, and... To be honest, as much as I loved her, it scares the shit out of me when I think of getting eaten alive. If you can read this, babe, I love you. I went to bed after watching a few minutes of the news and eating a banana. I can still remember the weird vibe on the good morning shows. Kind of tense, but sort of laughing it off. I can still remember the look on the dude's face as he reported it. Kind of like he was waiting for an April Fool's to pop up on his teleprompter. It never came, I guess. So I went to bed. I slept pretty good until about 3 p.m. I remember distinctly waking with a start, jarred awake. It took me a few minutes to piece together what actually woke me up, but the second gunshot kind of solved that riddle. 
It came from outside my window in the condo complex, and I knew instantly something was very wrong. My curtains are taped right to the window frames to block out the light, so I pulled on my gym shorts and hustled downstairs to look out the glass slider on the back side of the house. The action had ended by the time I got down there, but about thirty feet from where my place is, I could clearly see a dead body laying in the parking lot. Have you ever seen someone take a shotgun blast to the head? It's horrible. There's no head left to speak of, first off, and secondly, the body just empties the blood out of what's left of the head. More of a neck by that point, really. The body, a woman, incidentally, was kind of laying towards my place, kind of downhill, and the blood was running into the mulch at the foot of the pine tree right behind my place. I've seen dead bodies before. I've been around violence plenty of times, but this was weird. It was in my neighborhood. You know, your sanctuary. I imagine the way I felt looking at her head stump empty was a lot like watching your house burn down or coming home to realize your house had been broken into. I felt violated. Anyway, I grabbed my sweatshirt, my cell phone, slipped my sandals on, and sprinted out the back, dialing 911 as I went. I tripped over a root from the fucking pine tree and ate shit on the way, but I got there. She was dead. Of that, there was no doubt. Her head was absolutely demolished. She was wearing a garish, flowery patterned shirt that looked a lot like the kind of shirts that a pediatric nurse would wear. She definitely had pants that looked a lot like those greenish scrub pants you see nurses wearing. I made my decision. Headless shotgun woman had been a nurse only a short time ago. At that point, I realized my 911 call wasn't going through, getting the all-circuits-busy bullshit, which instantly set off my oh-shit radar. My groggy-ass brain finally started to put two and two together. The zombie shenanigans from last night may not have been a hoax. I don't own a gun. My girlfriend was kind of twitchy, and she had a little bit of a temper, and I didn't really want a firearm around that cocktail. It was far too foreseeable to see me getting shot because she thought I was a robber or something, so no guns. I did, however, own a few very high-quality swords, competently made and purchased at a few nerd festivals over the year. I really didn't want to grab a sword and just go driving around on the outside chance that this was just a random shooting, but I knew I had to get the fuck back inside one way or the other. If this was a random shooting, the random shooter was still pretty fucking nearby, and I was not in the mood to get head-stumped myself. So I ran inside. This time, I did not eat shit on the route from the pine tree and made it inside like an Olympic sprinter. I do remember being really pissed at myself because I left the slider open and my friggin' cat Otis was sitting right on the fringe of watching me the time. I didn't want him to get out as he's an inside cat. He's a Maine coon, so he's a beefy guy, but I would have been pissed if he got hit by a car or shot by a psycho with a 12-gauge. Seems like a reasonable concern, considering the prior events, right? Whatever, dude. I love my cat. He's my homeboy. So, by then, I'd tried dialing 911 like four times. I had the number for the police station already in my contact, so I called that line, and I got their automated response. The emergency choice just routed me to 911, and I was right back where I started. At that point, I knew shit was bad. Can't be a coincidence. I hit the TV on, and there it was. The EAS message. You know, that irritating noise you hear when they're testing the emergency system? And very fucking rarely is there ever an emergency. I mean... I guess in the Midwest when they get tornadoes, or in the South when a hurricane is coming, it's more relevant than here. All we ever get is shit like emergency snowstorm warnings, or shit like road closures or accidents. I'll never forget the message from that day. State and local agencies are reporting widespread attacks on citizens across the region. Authorities are advising people to stay inside, lock their doors, bar their windows, and only open doors for known friends and family who respond intelligently. That was it. No mention of a virus, aliens attacking, zombies, vampires, or any such nonsense. I mean, I know now, after having seen it a few hundred times, we're dealing with zombies, but that message had no info at all. For the astute horror fan, though, that's when I knew it was on. You know, as in, it's on like Donkey Kong. I tried calling my girlfriend, both on her cell phone and at her work extension, but no dice. I'm pretty fortunate in that I don't panic, like, ever. I've got years of experience dealing with violence, and I just don't lose my cool when the shit hits the fan. I'm the kind of dude you want making decisions in dangerous situations. Enough about me. I'm writing history now. More about me later, when I have less to write about. 
I knew she was dead, or at least damn close to it. None of the channels would work, so I grabbed my laptop and fired it up. After connecting to my network, I went to all the news websites and immediately found out I was right. Picture after picture after cell phone video after news broadcast, all showing zombies. Of course, no one had the fucking balls to call it like that. People were calling it everything but. Theories abounded everywhere I pointed the mouse, but I knew. You could see it. They were dead already and didn't attack others until they'd passed on. I knew I needed to know a few things immediately about whatever it was that was doing this, so I got all scientific and went to the CDC website. They were on the ball, thankfully, and had the info as best they could already up. I needed to know a few things specifically. Transmission. How did it get transmitted? According to the CDC, transmission occurred only via bite. Scratches didn't seem to pass along this sickness, curse, virus, evil. Further, they had confirmed that the illness did not spread to non-human victims. Apparently, a farm in Pennsylvania had all their cows eaten by zombies, and they stayed dead. Of course, later on, I realized that this was somewhat wrong. You see, by that point, I don't think they had realized that anyone who died and didn't get their nugget wrecked immediately would get back up, seeking out flesh, being a general motherfucking nuisance to the living. But I worked with what I knew at that point. Did they eat flesh? The CDC confirmed that, yes, they did indeed eat the flesh of the living. Were the undead, sick, ill terrorists that ate flesh more or less dangerous than a normal human being? Once again, the CDC reported that the ill were slow, had diminished capacity for thought and reason, and were hostile to other human beings as well as animals. They were uncoordinated, couldn't move much faster than a clumsy trot at best, and showed no ability to communicate or make plans of any sort. Where did it all start? How close was I to ground zero? The CDC had no fucking clue. They said that there were about a dozen simultaneous reports from all over the world, plus or minus a few hours, which, globally speaking, is pretty fucking simultaneous. As best I could figure, I was about a two-hour drive from the closest outbreaks on the eastern seaboard. Could they be killed, and if so, how were they killed? According to the CDC, by now my most trusted source for news regarding the current and ongoing zombie apocalypse, any significant damage done to the brain would drop them again. So, Romero, dude, you were totally spot on. Fucking A, brother. So there it was. Despite the fact that even the CDC avoided calling it a zombie outbreak or the apocalypse, I fucking knew. Well, at the very least, I wasn't about to risk it. I grabbed up my phone and tried to make a few more phone calls, but no joy. All circuits still busy. So I formulated my plan. Mom lived about a mile away, right near downtown, right near the schools, and I knew I would swing by her place to see if she was okay. I had a few friends who lived right around town, too, and I wanted to check on them. More importantly, though, was a long-term survival plan. My condo was shitty in terms of a place to hole up, so I needed a place to go. I knew almost immediately I would come here, back to the school. It had everything. I would get guns, some supplies, food, and then head to the school. Ride it out from there and see what happens. As you can tell, I made it here in one piece, but that doesn't tell the whole story. Unfortunately, my guilt over wasting this gas has finally reached its boiling point. Plus, I'm getting really fucking tired, and I need to lock the upstairs down so I can sleep soundly. I think for my next entry, I'll talk about the trip to get here and what I found when I did. Until next time, Mr. Journal, Adrian. September 27th. Hi, Mr. Journal. I think it's all starting to get to me. I did not have a very good week here at all. Nothing bad happened, which is awesome, really, but I think spilling my guts last Tuesday opened up some fucking epic wounds I'd really forgotten about. I'm sitting here with tears welling up in my eyes as I think about the fact that I didn't go and at least try to find Kaz. Cassie. Just typing her name is hard for me to do right now. I sat here looking at this blank white sheet of pixelated paper for almost an hour, just trying to think of something to write about, but I couldn't. All I could think about was the fact that my awesome goddamn plan that day didn't include at least trying to rescue the woman I should have married. I mean, I'm alive, and that's good, but... It all seems pretty fucking pointless without her here. Like, 
Why do I even bother to make myself dinner when she's not here to tell me how bad my cooking is? We were together for so long, and I just don't know why I didn't ask her to marry me sooner. Fear of commitment? Wedding was too expensive? Was I afraid her parents would say no? Shit, I don't know. And it kills me I never will know. My mouth is bone dry right now. I can't even swallow. I've sat in bed, snuggled up with Otis, and just laid there thinking about this. I've been so busy getting this place safe from the zombies that I haven't had time to really think about it until now. She has to be dead, right? She was never the survivor type. She lost her goddamn mind when there was a spider in the house. Can't envision her keeping her shit together when people are dying all around her, then sitting up and attacking her, too. My most frequent delusion about her death is that she died in a car accident trying to get out of the city. You know, she would have taken the stairs to get out of the building, ran to her car, dodging the undead's awkward lunges. I can see her starting her little car, backing out into the street, and then getting creamed at an intersection by some fucking asshole in a giant SUV trying to do the same thing as her. In my guilt-filled vision, she not only is killed instantly, but is either decapitated or is so mangled that she can't get back up as the undead. I think thinking of it that way makes me feel like it's better that way. At least if she died that way, she isn't hurting anyone else. And at least that way, I'll never have to worry about seeing her disintegrating body shambling towards me some day. Man, I hope that never happens. I don't think I could take seeing that. Seeing her beautiful face all ashen and bloody, teeth bared, slowly clawing at the air as she comes towards me. Just typing that makes my fucking skin crawl. There's this enormous part of me that says I should go get a truck from the maintenance barn and make my way to her work. For closure. I know I won't find her. At least, I know I won't find her alive. I think if I did find her car smashed to shit in an intersection, I might feel better about myself. About my decision that day. You know, at least I could say that I was right about not going to try to find her. She was probably already dead by the time I even knew what was going on that day. There's no chance I could have saved her. Then the little prick inside me says, Adrian, but what if you find her dead, walking along the road, slowly making her way home, slowly making her way back to you? And my ambition to go get closure just dries right the fuck up. I think that little prick, that little voice inside me is my cowardice. I never thought of myself as a coward. Really, I've waded into some pretty dangerous shit in my 34 years on this planet, and not once did I give it a second thought. Why the fuck did I give up on her so easily that day? Fuck you, Mr. Journal. Adrian. September 28th Mr. Journal, I am profoundly sorry for my outburst at the end of the last journal. Good sentence right there. I think a few of my English teachers just rolled over in their graves. Well, actually, a few of my English teachers probably just burped up the entrails of a few of my math teachers, but you get the idea. Sorry, surviving English teachers. That was pretty tasteless. Pun not intended. I feel better about myself today. I think yesterday's journal entry was cathartic for me. Finally, admitting out loud that I failed myself and Kaz that day has relieved me of some guilt. I actually slept pretty good last night for the first time since my first journal entry. I've been restless for a long time, and it was really rejuvenating to get a full eight hours of sleep. Otis can sense my troubles, too, and it's had him on edge. He's been largely avoiding me for a few days now, and finally this morning, he actually came up to me as I woke up and looked for some attention. Apparently, he can figure out when I'm emotionally capable of giving him some affection. I am so thankful he's still around. After I gave him his love this morning, I had a bit of a startle. The campus here is pretty fucking out of the way. We're at the end of a country dead-end road in a small town, miles from anything even remotely looking like civilization. There are maybe fifteen houses along the five miles heading up the hills to get here. Our campus is surrounded by water. There's a lake all along one side of the property, and the lake has a river draining down the hill we're on that skirts the other side of the property. Shit, you need to cross a bridge to get here. It's as close as you can get to an island without needing a boat. Hence, part of its allure is a last-ditch place to hold up. I parked two of the transport vans we used to use to get the kids around on the far side of the bridge, and there's no way anything can get across. Someone could climb across the top, but the zombies are far too stupid to put that plan together. Living people would need to get out and cross on foot if they were coming to visit. I hate using my guns now. A. It's a waste of ammunition. 
B, we have an archery range here, and arrows are reusable if I do it right, and C, guns are loud and could theoretically draw unwanted attention. Anyway, when I went out to check the campus for dead folk, lo and behold, there were two zombies shuffling and milling about on the far side of the vans. I don't think they knew I was here, but honestly, I didn't ask them. It took me three arrows to hit both of them in the head and re-kill them, so to speak. My first shot just thunked right into the dry, empty eye socket of the first zombie. He dropped like a bag of wet laundry. My second shot sailed pretty wide right. I'm not sure why. It felt good when I let it go, but third time's the charm and I hit the other zombie squarely in his brain pan. I sat still for a bit, waiting to see if there were any other undead dudes on the other side of the bridge, and after a bit I crossed carefully and retrieved all three arrows. All three were fine for use again. I really didn't want to leave those bodies there, so I got my rubber gloves, my shitty overalls, and got the four-wheeler with the little trailer on it, moved the vans, and drove the two corpses to the far back side of the campus, out where the faculty residences are, or used to be. Not sure what the proper tense is on that. I mean, technically the residences are still there, but the faculty that used to live in them is long since gone. I guess it doesn't matter. Both of the bodies were heavy as hell and smelled fucking awful. Not the sick, rotting, putrid flesh smell, more of a rotting fecal matter and kelp odor. I know, charming. Anywho, moved the vans back, chilled out for a bit to make sure everything was quiet, and I hit the campus cafeteria and snagged some canned stuff to eat for the day. I'm finally getting accustomed to moving about without the constant fear of being attacked around every corner. At first, right after all the shit started, I moved through life in a slow and smooth combat walk, gun at the ready. Every single door was breached like I was either a super-secret sneaky spy or like I was kicking in a door in a slum in Baghdad looking for Wahhabi. It's only been the last few days that I've felt safe enough to basically just live life like normal. LOL. Normal. What the fuck is that now? Normal is not being pretty okay with watching a dead human being gnawing away at the flesh of a slowly dying person. Normal is not reasoning with yourself that everything in that situation is okay because the zombie is busy eating that person and will thus not attack you for some time, ergo you are safe. How fucked up is that? So I'm feeling pretty good right now. I have some warmed up canned corned beef hash, a couple slices of canned brown bread, and some hot instant coffee. I'm feeling a little better about my utter scumbuggery regarding leaving the love of my life to die a bitter, lonely death, and I actually feel like dropping more into this journal. Sound okay to you, Mr. Journal? I thought you'd like the attention. As soon as I get Otis off the screen of the laptop, I'll tell you a story. There we go. I'm sure he'll be back up in my lap shortly anyway. I'll get done what I can in the meantime. Where was I? Uh, so I had formulated a plan to get to what I felt was relative safety food, supplies, guns, check on friends and family, and get here to the school. Not necessarily in that order. I live about two miles from the local gun store. I could see and hear cars still driving by on Main Street outside the complex, so I knew it wasn't total devastation. Probably panicked, probably fucked up a lot, but probably still, you know, held together. After I got dressed, I grabbed a mess of shit and loaded my car. A suitcase and a duffel bag of clothes were first. I grabbed my two best swords and strapped my dad's old hunting knife to my belt. It's a badass knife my uncle made a long time ago out of a piece of heavy-duty file. It looks like something straight out of a horror movie. I use an old K-bar sheath for it when I go hiking, so it looks even more badass. <laughs> like how badass I look is going to help when I'm getting mauled by the undead, right? Very feminine of me to think about how I look at a time like that. Kaz always said I was sensitive. I snagged an old plastic milk crate and loaded all the food in the kitchen that would last into it. Everything canned, everything frozen, anything bottled. I filled every water bottle we had and dumped out the milk jugs and filled those with water, too. No idea how long running water would be available, and I wanted as much as possible. I grabbed Kaz's sewing kit, uh, my dad's old fishing rod and tackle box, our first aid kit, and my toolbox. I grabbed a few other odds and ends, like boots and shoes, miscellaneous items that might come in handy, Books, some hobby-oriented shit, and then I got Otis into his travel cage thingy. He fucking despises that thing with a passion. Some of the worst scars I have come from him fighting me when I try and get him in there. That day, though, he was pretty good. I remember vividly one of my last memories of my condo that day was seeing that nurse's body in the parking lot again. 
Her blood wasn't anywhere near as red on the pavement anymore. It had already started to turn a muddy, rusty brown color, which is normal. Blood is bright red, especially when it's arterial blood, which is what she'd been squirting all over the place when I first saw her. I can remember still that... I can remember still that seeing her body the second time around didn't weird me out at all. I think I can attribute that to two things. First, my natural sense of calm when the shit hits the fan, and second, I knew that the nurse was probably undead when she was shot. It kind of made me feel good to know that someone had the presence of mind to drop her quickly. Of course, I also wondered today that maybe someone just blew her head off and was going to use the whole zombie thing as an excuse. The more I think about it, the more plausible some variation of that idea seems right. After all, when you kill a zombie, they don't really bleed. They just kind of ooze. She was totally squirting. Sounds totally dirty. Maybe she'd just been bitten, was still alive, and then she got shot? Uh, who knows. My last memory from my place was seeing her body in the parking lot. I loaded Otis in the car, double-checked that I had everything I would need, and we were off to Moore's Sporting Goods. Moore's was a scene straight out of an end-of-the-world movie. There was a cop in the parking lot providing barely adequate security as, like, thirty cars filled with people stormed in and out of the shop, buying everything in sight. I remember being suddenly doubtful of me being able to get anything at all there, but I was there. I had to go in. I know all the cops in town on a first-name basis, or at least by face, and the cop in the parking lot was one I've known for years, Officer McGreevy. Big dude. Bigger than me, and that's saying something. Bald as shit, though, which is something I'm not. He was struggling, trying to talk to a few panicked older people, and we exchanged glances. I knew just from the look on his face, shit was bad all over. He had that no-nonsense, shit-was-bad look on his face. You know the one. There was almost a line to get into the shop. Luckily, Moores had extra people behind their counters, so they were ringing people up pretty quickly. I noticed a few big hastily scribbled signs taped up in conspicuous places around the shop. Each said the same thing. There is a one rifle, one handgun, and one shotgun limit per customer. Thank you. Moores. Good enough. If you couldn't figure out how to get through this with all that, you were fucked anyway, I think. I waited patiently in the three-deep crowd at the counter until one of the clerks finally motioned for me to come up. I can remember his name tag was crooked, like the safety pin had come undone in the back. His name was Phil. Phil was overweight, like I was, had salt and pepper hair, and the look of a person who'd had fucking enough. I made my decision to keep it professional. I calmly requested to Phil that I was interested in a Glock handgun, preferably a 9mm or forty caliber, a pump or semi-auto shotgun, preferably 12 or 16 gauge, and a semi-automatic twenty two caliber rifle, one preferably with a magazine. He told me they were flat out of Glocks entirely, but they did have a few Sig 9mm left. I told him that was fine, and he got the rest of my order. Now, I'm not saying the fine folks of Moore's made a poor decision that day, or that our legal system failed our nation, but... There was no background check performed on anyone while I was there. Now, I have a clean record, but some of the folk there were shady as hell. Capital S added for extra emphasis on shady. Phil was nice enough to sell me 2,000 rounds of the twenty two caliber ammo, 200 rounds of 9mm, and 48 12-gauge double-aught shells. He told me he was giving me the hookup, and even sold me two spare magazines, that's a clip for the uninformed, for both the rifle and the pistol. Those would be a big deal, as you'll see in later entries. I also got a few extra things of gun oil, a fresh gun cleaning kit, as well as a holster and a hunting vest to wear for the shotgun shells and supplies. The line had died down pretty dramatically while Phil waited on me, and he and I chatted a bit. The folks here were in tight with the cops, and they had a better local feel for what was up. Apparently, there were no zombies from here yet. The few zombies seen nearby were people who had come in from out of state already bitten, or already sick somehow. Of course, those few folks had bitten some other folks, and it was slowly spreading. The cops were doing a great job of containing shit from the sound of it, but even after hearing that, I wasn't fucking around. I had Phil charge it all on my credit card and walked out more or less armed to the teeth. Officer McGreevy was currently unimpeded by panicked customers when I walked out, so I waved hello, and he tiredly waved back. I loaded up my weapons, illegally, right in front of him in the parking lot, and we exchanged one last wave. As I drove away down the road, I heard a few gunshots from behind me, back down where the shop was. I stomped the brakes, threw it in reverse, and backed down the road into the parking lot. 
A new car with out-of-state plates was in the lot, and McGreevy had his weapon drawn on the vehicle. One of the Moore's employees, not our intrepid hero, Clerk Phil, was in the doorway, handgun drawn as well. From inside my car I could see that the driver of the out-of-state sedan was face down on the ground, bleeding a circle out underneath him. The passenger of the car was a little boy, maybe fourteen years old, brown hair, screaming bloody murder. McGreevy's pistol shot once more, caving in the back of the dude's head, splattering shit everywhere on the fender of the car. I noticed then that the guy had a huge red mark on the sleeve of his dress shirt. Looked an awful lot like a big fucking bite mark. My guess was he looked sick. McGreevy saw the bite mark and made a quick decision. I could see clearly from his face the cop was not cool with what had just happened. I could also see the Moores guys coming out, practically celebrating that they'd gotten one. McGreevy looked up at me in my car, sighed once, and nodded really slightly. The kid was still screaming. I never saw any of them again. Adrian October 2010 October 4th Hello again, Mr. Journal. You know, all this week I was wondering to myself why I sort of randomly decided that you were Mr. Journal, as opposed to Ms. Journal or Mrs. Journal, or even Miss Journal. Maybe I'm subconsciously only comfortable spilling my guts to an artificial male. I don't know. Maybe at a later date I'll decide to spill my guts to a new target audience and change it, you, to Miss Journal. Maybe Miss Journal will want my shit and I'll get laid again. Guess I should make my stories good then, eh? Another thought occurs to me, though. If I change Mr. Journal to Miss Journal, and I'm hoping Miss Journal wants my shit, does that mean I'm into trannies? Now there's a Zen train of thought for you. It's been a pretty good week since my last entry. Not much of anything has happened here on campus. I spent the majority of my time working in the vocational building in the wood shop. We had a shit ton of lumber stored there, and I was working on making myself some barricades. The dorms here aren't like you'd imagine for a normal boarding school. They aren't like Hogwarts, and they aren't like apartment buildings. We have five dorm buildings all broken up by age groups and grades. Each building is more or less like a giant house. Three of the dormitories are two floors, one is three floors, and one is just one floor. Stylistically, they're all pretty similar to houses, but they're beefed up and industrialized. Each dorm's exterior doors are all fire doors with heavy-duty locks. That means they're steel, lock when they close, and are set in heavy-duty frames. Perfect for fending off zombie attacks, basically. Now, each dorm has certain perks going for it. Hall A is good because it's dead center on campus. Windows in the dorm face in all directions, and it's got a great view of the bridge that people or the undead, would cross to get here. Hall A is shitty because the first floor is very low to the ground. Its windows would be easy to break, and there are a lot of windows for the breaking. The second floor is good because the two stairwells are separate from the first floor. Both are behind fire doors, and they're on separate ends of the building. Plus, the second floor has a little balcony off the staff apartment that used to belong to Mr. Trendwell, the physics teacher. Hall E is about 200 feet down the sidewalk from A. Both Hall E and Hall A are near the river that skirts campus, which is nice when you open a window. You can hear the babbling of the water, and it's relaxing. Hall E has a lot of things going for it. It's kind of on the edge of a hill, and there are no windows on ground level. The bottom of the window started about five feet above ground level, so breaking a window would be difficult for a zombie. I've already got those windows barricaded with two-by-fours and plywood, so that's covered. I was clever, and only blocked off the bottom two-thirds of the window so I could still see out the window or shoot out them if necessary. Other benefits of Hall E are as follows. Full kitchen, three floors, two living rooms, standard-issue double fire doors at both entrances, and 18 bedrooms. Hall E seemingly had the least drawbacks, so that's where I'm set up now. I'll tell you more about the campus and other buildings here later. Just about every building here has some kind of fucked up story to tell about it, and I don't want to miss any of the juicy details. Gotta impress Miss Journal for when she shows up, right? The barricades I worked on this week were for some of the buildings that are low to the ground here. Specifically, I really want to get the deck on the end of Hall E more secure. It's on the edge of the building that's overhanging the hill, so it's about eight feet off the ground, but I really want to shore up the railings in the event I'm swamped and trapped here. So that was my project this week. I had enough lumber, skill, and ambition to get that project done. Huzzah me! 
The whole time I was working in the shop, I kept my shotgun handy and didn't use any of the power tools. Noise is bad, and plus, there's no sense in wasting my gas. My supply is obviously limited, and it's not like I've got more important shit to do. Handsaws for the win. I think I should probably fill in more details about my trip here, though. There's still so much story left just from the day the world fell apart. I'll be talking about it in journal entries until Thanksgiving, more than likely. So, I think I said earlier that things happened so fast, a plan was kind of impossible. Everything according to my plan had gone pretty much perfectly up until the shooting at Moore's. And really, that incident didn't change my plan at all. That was the first really fucked up thing I was sort of involved in that day, so I kind of look at that as the tipping point where things started to seriously come undone for me. So I left the gun shop and started to update my plan. I now had guns and ammo. The most important and useful things from my house were in my trunk and back seat, so all I needed to do was check on my friends and stock up on food. Non-perishable stuff, of course. As I got off the side street Moore's is on, I saw the local agriculture store, and it suddenly dawned on me I might need to grow food. I also noticed that the parking lot was almost empty, so I made my first detour. Everyone in the store was huddled at the counter listening to the radio and the news streaming out of it from NPR. I didn't want to waste any time, as it was already starting to get late, so I just went straight to the seed display. I literally grabbed one little pouch of everything they had and snagged one of those garden weasel dealies. I knew the groundskeeping equipment at the school would probably have whatever else I needed. I remember it took me asking about ten times before the chick running the register even realized I was waiting to pay. She rang me up totally wrong and only charged me like fifteen bucks for everything. I had enough cash, so I paid, took my bag and garden aerator thingamabob, and walked out totally unnoticed. All that shit went into the back seat, and I was off again. When I was about to pull out of the parking lot, one of the town ambulances flew by, headed down the road Moores was on. I assumed they were headed to deal with the shooting. Another one of our town's finest was right on the ambulance's ass as well. That was actually the last time I saw a cop. Weird now to think that it's been months since I've seen a cop. Weird now to think that the dead come alive and feast on the flesh of the living, too. Lols and whatnot. So... Our local chain grocery store is on the other side of downtown, about three miles or so from where I was. I knew it'd be a madhouse, but I really needed food. I drove just under the speed limit, mostly because I wanted to scan the surroundings for weirdness. Oddly enough, I saw little. There were a lot of people packing their cars, and I saw a lot of dads and sons out in the yard hammering nails into sheets of plywood, covering windows. I saw one desperate dude hammering up a door over a window and had to laugh. I wonder still how many of those folks are still holed up in their houses. I haven't done any tests, but I imagine a sheet of plywood wouldn't last long against a bunch of the undead hitting it over and over. Granted, they are weaker than a person, but they don't fucking get tired. The only break they take is to gnaw your flesh off your bones. Otherwise, they just keep at it, whatever it is they're doing. Anyway, downtown was pretty tame. The power was still on, and I ran the red light cautiously in the center of town. There was no traffic, and I wanted to get to the store to get food before it was literally gobbled up. The final two miles to the store was more or less uneventful. I got passed on the road twice by jackasses driving giant pickup trucks. One of them flipped me off as he passed me on a solid yellow, and I just had to laugh. World is ending, and this guy is such a dink that he has to give me the finger for not doing sixty in a thirty. Some people are just assholes. I hope he got eaten by another asshole. The second guy who passed me was much nicer, though. No middle finger. The grocery store was mobbed, as I thought it would be. I parked on the edge of the parking lot and locked up the car. I slipped on my hunting vest, loaded it up with the shells Phil hooked me up with, and slung the shotgun over my shoulder. It was at that moment that I realized I needed to shorten the barrel and stock on the shotgun somehow. It was a little long and would be difficult to use in a building. I made a mental note to myself on that for later. I could clearly see the other folks leaving the store carrying hunting rifles, so... I wasn't too worried about the social norm of carrying a 12-gauge. I did get the opportunity to watch some woman in a minivan fucking cream a dude walking in the parking lot, though. She must not have seen him, because she just plowed through his ass and drove on. The ass end of the minivan hopped up like it was on springs when she drove over him. A bunch of folks rushed over to help him right after, so I didn't feel obligated to. I snagged a cart out of the corral, and just like Johnny Shopper, I went in the automated door and straight into retail hell. 
You ever been grocery shopping the week of Thanksgiving or right before Christmas when all the soccer moms lose their fucking mind and fight over boxes of shitty stuffing mix and cranberry relish? Well, imagine that, then add an end-of-the-world flavor to it. That'll get you in the ballpark for the mood everyone had in the store that afternoon. I think it was about 5 or 5.30 at that point, just starting to get darkish, and I could remember the temp getting low as the sun was setting. Anyway, the lines were packed, and people were literally running their carts around the store, up and down the aisles like with reckless abandon. There were kids hollering at the top of their lungs as their moms and dads shopped literally like there was no tomorrow. I can't even imagine what a six-year-old would make of the situation. PTSD without a doubt for our children now, if there are any children left. Like all grocery stores, the majority of the canned goods are in the center of the store. Most of the folks were in those two aisles, so I decided to start on the fringe and get other shit first. By the time I was done, I had grabbed an entire shopping cart of food and supplies. Felt like I was pushing a pallet of bricks. I hit the pharmacy area hardcore and loaded up on bandages, ibuprofen, cold remedies, vitamins, melatonin, bacitracin, etc. You name it, I grabbed it. I wasn't about to worry about running out of that stuff. For those of you who are curious, yes, I did grab several boxes of yellow cream-filled snack cakes. I didn't want to risk wanting one and having to come back to get them. So, I snagged a mess of frozen veggies and shit like that, and I eventually intimidated my way into the canned goods aisles. Six foot one with scary tattoos is greater than a soccer mom. I knew the school kept a lot of canned shit on hand, so I made sure to grab the stuff I knew they would likely have little or none of. Boy RD stuff, obviously. And I grabbed a lot of tuna pouches, canned veggies, and that righteously yummy canned brown bread you eat with beans. I also got the beans to go with it. Sneaky motherfucker that I am, I slipped behind the deli counter when the clerks weren't looking and grabbed a few whole, still-sealed slabs of meat. One each of turkey, ham, and bologna. So, my shamefulness comes back. The deli is kind of near the exit, and it took about two seconds of deliberation before I decided I was going to walk the fuck out without paying. What were they going to do anyway? Every employee had either left already or was gooch-deep in customers. The only shitty problem was that my groceries would not be bagged. Not a real problem, but I'll deal with that. Out the door I went, snagging two bunches of bananas on the way. Outside, things had gotten much fucking worse. Our grocery store patron, who had been creamed by the soccer mom in her minivan, was not doing well at all. Actually, he had died, and someone had thrown a heavy-duty blanket over him, one of those gray industrial blankets people steal out of the back of moving trucks. I gave the crowd around his body a wide berth and made it about fifty more feet before I heard them start screaming. I stopped dead in my tracks turned around, and watched the crowd scatter like dandelion fluff in the wind. I have never seen such fat people move with such vigor before. One lady with a mega fupa was literally tearing up pavement as she ran. I still laugh today thinking of her jiggling rolls as she nearly ate shit getting into her far too small compact car. It might have been the springs, but I swear to this day I heard her car cry out in pain when she got in it. Anyway, our poor accident victim had sat back up. From my angle, at the time, he was kind of facing away from me, and he still had the blanket covering his front side. He was blind, basically, with the blanket over his face. Morbid curiosity found me unslinging the shotgun and approaching the dude. I racked up around in the chamber and slowly circled him at about ten feet. You could just tell from his body language that he was fucked up. Plus, he was making this rattling noise with his quasi-breathing that was just not normal. Well, that's not entirely true. Uh, ever give someone CPR? Frequently, when you're giving real CPR, air gets down into the stomach. When the air escapes, it sometimes does this burpish gurgle deal that's kind of unsettling. It's the death rattle you read about. This dude was doing it, and he was moving around at the same time. Didn't make sense. I knew what it really meant, though. Just about when I got to his ten o'clock, the blanket slipped off his face, and I saw my first zombie. He was lit the fuck up. That accident had made him royally fucking nasty, and add to that all his color had drained away. His skin was this ashen white with a blue tinge. Dried blood crusted the edge of his mouth. He tried to stand up to come at me, but both his legs were shattered. He kinda half fell over in my direction and face-planted on the pavement. 
I remember laughing nervously when he started crawling at me because I saw his face had left a bloody wet mark where it had hit down. His eyes had totally glazed over and were almost whitish gray. He wasn't moaning like they do in the movies, either. It makes a lot of sense now that I've seen so many real zombies. Moaning requires breathing, and these things do not breathe. Once he'd finished his charming death rattle, he was silent. That's actually one of the things that keeps me up at night. If you don't hear the shuffling of their feet, see them coming, or smell them coming, they're almost entirely silent. After I made the mental decision that this man was indeed a newly minted zombie, I took a deep breath, drew a bead on his face, closed my eyes, and pulled the trigger. The Mossberg bucked hard, and I felt something hit the front of my pants. I opened my eyes and saw that his face was totally annihilated, and some of the splash had hit me in the legs. I panicked for a second, wondering if this shit was contagious. I took another deep breath and chilled myself out. Couldn't worry too much about it right then. I racked up another shell in the shotgun, noticed the startling amount of people looking at me with shocked expressions, and walked back to my cart. You know there were at least ten guys in the parking lot at that moment with a gun, just like me. Why didn't they do anything? Was I the only one with balls? I suspect I've just watched too many horror movies. The crowds parted like I was motherfucking Moses and they were the Red Sea. I'm a big dude and people frequently see me in my tattoos and get a wide berth anyway, but this was an adult strength wide berth. Twenty feet, solid. That kind of felt good. I was getting a hardcore adrenaline rush the whole time, and I'm not going to lie, it felt kind of good. I scooped my groceries into the trunk of my car, topping it off. I grabbed the box of shotgun shells from the passenger seat of my car, loaded a replacement shell for the one I just shot, and got in the car. Next stop, friends and family. See you soon, Mr. Journal. Adrian. October 7th. I'm kind of bored, Mr. Journal. Instead of my planned once-weekly entries, I'm doubling up this week. I know I've got enough gas to power the generator to keep me in heat and electricity for winter, so I can waste a little juice on keeping the laptop running. It's Thursday. I just ate some lunch, and things are pretty good here. Got my deck fully reinforced, and I pulled up all the stairs leading off it. Now there's no way they can get in via that entrance. Hall E has all the windows on the first floor barred up adequately, and the fire doors are strong enough to hold back a siege. I've also got clear lines of sight to all entrances to pick off a ton of zombies should things get desperate. I have a lot of lumber left over as well, so I'm starting to think of what else I should really be reinforcing. I don't know yet. This place is pretty huge, and I don't want to waste the wood. Otis is well. Nice of you to ask. I'm definitely wishing I had grabbed more cat food for him, though. I only thought to grab two large bags of food, and that's getting low. I know I can share my food with him, but that's not ideal cat food, you know. I guess eventually I'll have to seriously consider our run back in town to restock. There has to be food still in town somewhere, and I can't imagine that our residents thought to grab up all the cat food. In all honesty, I really ought to start formulating a plan to get down there as soon as possible. I'm starting to notice food choices are getting slim at dinner, and if there are other survivors in town, I want to make sure I get the food before them. Selfish, but it's the reality now. I'm as likely to get shot and killed by another living person as I am to get eaten alive by the undead. I'll start to look at my options this week. I can tell it's going to be a pisser of a winter, and I don't want to have to leave here in a snowstorm. I should also stop by my house and get more of my own stuff. I'll be cooped up inside for most of the coming winter, and I don't want to get stir-crazy. It's entirely possible boredom might drive me to desperate measures, and I'd rather cut that off at the pass. What to talk about? Me? The past? More of the story from the day it all started. I don't really want to say much about myself. I think we're all delusional about our self-image anyway. What I type in this little journal will be just a vision of myself, not a real accounting of reality. I guess eventually I'll have to say something, but for now go fly a kite. You already know my name, my height, and that I've got a lot of tattoos. I also mentioned briefly that I had experience with violence. I worked concert security and did bouncing for 13 years on the weekends. I also did some bodyguard work here and there, and did my stint in the army. Plus, dad and three brothers were all military, so that was my culture at home. Anyway, I'm feeling like dropping more history now about the day the world ended, so let's get that ball rolling. <laughs> I had to open my last journal entry to see where I'd left off. So, by the time I got all my groceries into my truck, it was 6 p.m. 
I figured I had another solid hour of twilight before dark, and I really wanted to be done here in town before it was dark. The thought of wandering around in the dark with the undead wandering still sends ice water through my veins. I checked Otis to make sure he was okay, which he was, and I formed a mental map out of town and where my friends were, and in what order I needed to check on them in. Mom was first. She was probably the closest, likely the least capable of dealing with the crisis, and had some skills that I knew would be useful if things got dragged out. In retrospect, I fucking despise being around my mother, and I really should have thought of that. Second was my good friend and co-worker, Steve. Steve lived on Main Street, but he was good to go by himself. He was smart, resourceful, had a decent car, and probably wasn't home anyway. He frequently went into the city after he woke up, so there was a good chance he was already gone. Third was Kaz and I's friends, John and Dorothy. They lived outside town with their four-year-old daughter, and I really wanted to try and get them to come with me to the school. They would be last, though, as they were the furthest out. The rest of my family all lives in the city, or just outside of it, so they were too risky, at least for tonight. Mom lives on School Street downtown, weirdly enough, next to the school. She was getting up there, about seventy, and she'd just moved into senior housing a few months earlier. She hated it, but she couldn't afford much else. Kaz and I both felt her moving in with us was not an option. I left the parking lot of the grocery store, driving slowly. This time, though, I had the SIG in my lap as I drove. Things were much more serious in my mind now. I had just seen a zombie, just shot a zombie, and now knew for sure it was happening right here, right now. School Street was maybe a mile away. The short drive to Mom's place put things into perspective for me. I didn't see a single zombie on the way there, but that makes total sense. Unless you were bitten or died of some other cause, there would be no reason to see one. Mind you, I was still operating partially thinking the CDC was right about how transmission was only by bite. I hadn't quite fully made the connection that parking lot zombie had never been bitten yet. Anyway, I realized there was probably a bit of a buffer of time still until people started to die. As long as I could avoid human-on-human -human violence, I should be pretty good. Keeping suit with my new criminal side, I ran the light again, but this time turned onto School Street, heading toward Mom's. There were way more people out and about now. Lots of folks still boarding up their places, and even more loading up their cars and vans with shit to get out of town. I imagine a lot of people were going to head north to get to even more rural areas. No idea how that panned out. Judging by my success, as long as they weren't total idiots, a lot of them should be just fine. I saw a few more fender benders before I got to Mom's place, but nothing that would generate a dead body, so no worries there. The senior housing place Mom lives in is a huge two-floor building. Imagine a hospital-style setting, only less sterile and mildly more homey feeling. I pulled my sedan into the parking lot right near the entrance closest to my Mom's apartment and got out. The scene there was also pretty hectic. From the looks of things, people were picking up their elderly family members and getting the fuck out of Dodge. Lots of old folks getting wheeled out in wheelchairs at top speed to waiting cars. I hopped out, locked the car, and headed towards the door. I left the Mossberg behind in favor of the SIG. The barrel of the shotgun was probably going to be longer than needed, and would likely be a hindrance if shit hit the fan. Speaking of that, just as I got to the big glass doors, someone burst out, nearly smashing me in the face. I remember stumbling backwards a few steps when I saw blood on them. It was a middle-aged man, somewhere around forty-five, maybe. I recall his hair was receding pretty badly, and he had an epic comb-over and really thick eyeglasses. His palms were slick with blood, and his sleeves were streaked with red all the way up the elbows. His neck was also covered in what looked like a spray of bright red blood, too. He just blew right by me in a total panic. I couldn't see any wounds or bites, so I didn't think to stop and ask him what was up. After watching him sprint across the parking lot to his waiting car, I pulled open the doors and headed in, drawing the SIG. There were bloody footprints all along the carpet in the lobby. The bloody tracks headed through the nurse station area, originating down the hallway my mom's apartment was. I instantly got a really bad feeling. I started to move really slow, handgun up, taking wide berth of doors. The intersection where the bloody footprints turned was a four-way, and you could see huge smears of blood on the walls and on the handrail that ran everywhere in the place. I swept around the corner and saw a cluster of people huddled in the middle of the corridor about twenty feet away. I don't remember exactly what I said, but it was something along the lines of, Hey there! But loud, like attention-grabbing. The people stood up slowly and turned. 
At first, I just thought they were old and moving in an arthritic fashion, but once I got a clear look at them turned around, I knew they were dead. Two old ladies and an old man, sallow and sunken-faced, covered in blood and gore. The lady closest to me had a massive wound in her neck that was ragged and semicircular, like a bite. The three of them had been eating someone on the floor in the hallway, and my shout had interrupted them. The trio of old zombies started to shuffle towards me. If it wasn't so fucking gross, it might have been kind of funny. Older people zombies, or injured people zombies, seemed to reanimate in as good a condition as they were in life. This is something I've learned. They stumbled, bumped into the walls, and moved at a crawl towards me, dripping blood all the way. I took a quick check behind myself to make sure there wasn't any behind me, and once I noticed it was all clear, I dealt with the three Methuselah. I'm a pretty good shot, thankfully, and put one in the face or forehead of all three of them. Start to finish, the entire encounter maybe lasted six seconds. At the time, it felt like forever, but adrenaline has this neat effect of slowing time down for you. Thank you for that, big person upstairs. I checked behind me again, and it was all clear. From the other side of the building, I could hear the screams of people fleeing from the gunshots, or perhaps other elderly zombies, so I knew I had a little time. Of course, this changed my estimates on my time buffer. These older folks had obviously died of natural causes and reanimated, so I knew at that point there was a much higher chance of there being more walking dead. I slowly approached the three bodies and gave them a good kick. I can remember wishing I'd brought sturdy work boots. Those are harder to bite through. The body in the hallway was my mom. I could have built it up all dramatic-like, but honestly, I don't have the writing skill. I think I knew, because when I got close enough to the body, I wasn't surprised at all that it was her. Her gray, bushy hair, the silly track pants she always wears, and the ugly housecoat nightgown thing she thinks is still stylish. I might have seen it in the fray, maybe. I don't know. I just remember not being surprised or moved, really. She was in pretty bad shape, though. Her clothes were ripped apart pretty good, and her chest had been chewed at. The burgundy rug in the corridor was stained a terrible black-brown around her from all the blood she'd lost. Her breast had been ripped or bitten off, leaving a gaping wound. She did have a peaceful look on her face, but I was pretty creeped out by her open eyes. I kneeled down and slowly closed her eyelids. Stupid move. Majorly, big-time dumb. She snapped at me as I pulled my hand away and was about a pubic hair's width from taking a finger right the fuck off. I can distinctly remember the clicking noise her teeth made when they clamped at the open air. I kicked away, launching my back right into the hall wall. That fucking hurt badly. She rolled over and started crawling towards me, pulling at my jeans to get closer. I fired a half dozen times from the hip as fast as I could pull the trigger, and at least two or three shots hit her in the face. God, I hate what that does to the face just fucking nasty. I got hit in the side of the neck by a few of the ejected shell casings, which gave me a nice little burn or two. She then slumped into my lap and proceeded to ruin my pants that I kind of hoped to salvage at a later date. At this point in the end of the world, I still didn't know if I'd be able to wash gore out with normal laundry detergent. I got her off me, calmed myself down, thought about what, if anything, she could have in her house that might be useful to me, and made my next plan. One amusing thing that occurred to me at that moment was the fact that dear old mom had false teeth. Would she have been able to infect me with falsies? It was the clicking noise that made me think about it. Food for thought, I guess. And that's the story of how I shot my mom. Think less of me yet? Adrian. October 11th. The weather seems to have taken a turn for the mild. It's gone up about 20 degrees on average over the last week, which is pretty awesome. Those 35-degree nights are going to be bad enough in January, let alone all frigging October and November. Of course, there's nothing I can do about it one way or the other. Can't change the weather. I can, however, change how I stay warm. This weekend, I actually did some work on what exactly I needed to do to stay warm. I think I mentioned earlier on that I had electricity, which I do. There was a good-sized generator in the basement of Hall E, where I am, that I got running. That makes it sound like I'm a mechanical miracle worker, though, which I'm not. It just needed a refill of gasoline and some basic cleaning. With the fuel I have in the tanks of all the vehicles parked around campus, I figure I have enough gasoline for electricity for maybe six hours a day. 
what I really need to think about is the fact that the heat here is supplied via oil furnace. The furnace has electric ignition, though, which means it will only fire when there's electricity supplied to it. So there's a few problems I need to deal with. I checked the various oil tanks on campus, and there is a metric fuck ton of oil for me to burn. Each building has oil heat, and almost every building has a pretty full 500 or 1,000 gallon tank. I should have oil for years. However, I do not have enough gasoline to run the generator for years. There's about 20 vehicles on campus, and most of those have less than half a tank of gas. I figure that's about 200 gallons of gas at most. I'll need heat overnight at the very least during winter, which is at least six hours, which means all my gasoline will be used up generating electricity strictly to keep my furnace running. Not really a great situation. I definitely need to address two problems. One, I need way more gasoline. I need gas for the cars, should I ever need to leave here, and I need gas to power the electric generator. Two, I need a more renewable heating system, something like a wood stove. There's trees all over the place here, and I will never run out of firewood. Shit, there's enough downed trees to keep me in firewood for this year just on campus. So now what? What's my first step to solving the heat and gasoline riddle? I have no additional reserves here on campus to tap into that I'm aware of, so that means going into town. Well, at least that means going to a convenience store or something where I can get more gas. Worst case scenario, there's a small gas station about four miles from here down the road I can hit. I know there are manual cranks to get the pumps working, and if I can scrounge up some gas cans, I think I can get myself set up pretty good. I know very friggin' little about installing wood stoves, though. I don't even know where to find one. So I guess I should start thinking about how to hit the gas station. If I'm even a little lucky, the electricity will still be on down there. Though if my power is out here, it's probably out down there. I was surprised how long the power stayed running, though, almost six weeks before it shit the bed. There's about twelve houses in the little neighborhood where the store is. There's also a country store with gas pumps about half a mile from there, too, which is an option. I'm betting there might be food at both places still. It stands to reason that if people downtown went out after the shit got bad to get food, they probably went to the grocery stores and the shops downtown. These fringes of town places might not have been picked over yet. I guess yet is the operative word here. I guess the sense of urgency in getting to any leftover supplies should motivate me to get my ass in gear. All right, here's my plan. Find as many gas cans as possible first off. Maintenance has two F-150 dump body trucks. Those are pretty sturdy vehicles, and the dump body is big and could be used to climb into if I get surrounded. It's pretty high off the ground, and the solid steel is obviously tough as hell. Plus, I checked, and truck number one still has a full tank, so that's a plus. Take truck number one, load up the guns, sword, and ammo, and head to the closest convenience store. At the store, my main plan is to get gas into all gas cans. That's my primary need. I have enough food to last me for winter, and then some, so that's a secondary thing. However, if the coast is mostly clear and I'm feeling good, I'll check the stores for anything food or supply-related that I could use. It'll be a thrill for sure to head back into this scary world again. What are the downsides of doing this, though? I haven't really considered that yet. Um, getting killed is obviously one. I really don't want to be eaten alive, and I sure as shit don't want to get killed by another survivor. I could definitely lead zombies or survivors back here, too. The school is at the end of a dead-end road, so if anyone sees me make the turn up here, all they gotta do is go straight to find me. I know the zombies are stupid, but one thing they can do is go straight for a long time. If one sees me turn, I could lead them back here. That'd lead to me defending the campus with guns, I'm sure, which might make enough noise to get more up here, spiraling everything into an enormous shitstorm. Let's face it, no one likes a fecal tornado. Good positive thoughts are important at a time like this. I'm sure there's more that could go wrong, but the simple fact is this. At the rate I'm burning through gasoline, I will not make it through winter. I will freeze. Scary thought, really. I also really need to think about alternative heating sources like the wood stove or something. Maybe I can look into solar panels or something. You know, a wood stove would be great for cooking, too. It'd save on the gas consumption big time. The electric stove is killing me, I'm sure. That and running the fridge. Well, 
Not so much any more, really, as I don't have anything perishable in there any more to speak of. Leftovers. In the winter, I can easily just set my leftovers outside somewhere the bears can't get at. Oh, yeah, we have bears up here. Forgot to mention that. I'm going to go check around campus tomorrow to see if there are spare gas cans. I'll also double-check around truck number one to make sure that it's in good shape for our run outside. I probably ought to be starting these cars more often and letting them run for a bit. Families of squirrels and field mice are probably inside all of them by now, too. I'll keep you updated on how things go. Adrian October 12th. Okay, my recon mission around campus is complete, I think. Down in the maintenance garage, way in the back of campus, I found three gas cans. They were whopping two-gallon cans. I searched all over the rest of campus, each and every building that was likely to have a gas can, and no luck. I did, however, find another two-gallon canister in the trunk of someone's car, though, parked in the employee lot. So that's eight gallons total. Not even worth a trip, really. So plan B. Instead of taking truck number one, I'm going to take truck number two. Truck number two has about a quarter of a tank of gas, which is more than enough to get me down there. According to the manual in the glove box, the truck has a 36-gallon tank. I figure I'll get about 30 gallons in the tank, which I can siphon off later, and then I can get eight more gallons in the small gas cans. If I'm lucky, they'll have more gas cans at the store. At the very least, roughly 38 gallons of extra gas will stretch out my fuel reserves. Plus, if it goes well, I can start making more frequent trips and just fill up the gas tanks of the vehicles around the school. Is it an ideal solution? Shit, of course not. Will it work for now until I figure this shit out? I surely hope so. I think this will work out. I can't imagine the area the store is at will be flooded with zombies. There's, what, twelve houses there? At absolute worst, there should be no more than, like, forty zombies. That's assuming most houses are producing three to four zombies per house. That's unlikely. Some of those people have to have left town or hold up somewhere else. I guess I'll find out tomorrow. Until then, Mr. Journal, I bid you adieu. Adrian October 12th, Second Entry Well, I sure as shit can't sleep. I'm all kinds of nerved up over going out tomorrow morning. I definitely decided morning was best. If something does happen and I need to come back on foot, I want as much daylight as possible to make it back. Moving around in the dark now absolutely petrifies me. There's some sense in thinking that the zombies are less dangerous at night, as their vision probably sucks ass compared to living people vision, so dark would be easier to move around. I'm still of the school of thought that my vision is compromised at night, and with these fuckers being so quiet, I'd rather use daylight to have a better chance of seeing them. So morning it is. After I finished typing today's earlier entry, I broke down all my guns and cleaned them. I'm only taking the 12-gauge and the SIG tomorrow, but I cleaned the 22 and the 30 6 as well. I'm sure I'll fill in the story how I got that at some point. Don't feel like talking about it right at the moment, though. I'm busy, and it's kind of a sore subject still. I should have plenty of gun-cleaning supplies to last me indefinitely. Pat myself on the back for grabbing the gun-cleaning kit and the extra gun oil at Moore's that day. I guess I can try and exhaust myself by talking more about that day. There's still a lot to tell. So, where was I? Just checked my last entry to remember, and as it turned out, I left off with me being an awesome son and shooting my mother in the face. So, I shot her in the face with the SIG, and she slumped down on top of my lap with her head leaking all over me. I'm pretty sure I was in some kind of shock for a few seconds after I got up. It didn't last long, though. As gross and weird as this sounds, shooting my mom in the face actually made it go way quicker, I think. And with her face gone, I couldn't, like, look at her and see what I'd done. With her face so mashed up, it could have been any old lady's body laying in front of me. It was like she was anonymous. So, like I said earlier, I thought about what my mom might have had that would be useful. Plus, I knew at this point I needed to stay busy or I might start getting emotional about shooting my mother. My mom was kind of a douche to me in life, but shit, she was my mom, right? I was having trouble thinking clearly, and I knew I needed to get out of the hallway anyway, so I decided to go inside the apartment where she lived. At least I could shut the door behind me for some semblance of safety and look firsthand at her place. I stepped over her body and got out my keys and let myself in. Her place was pretty normal. No mess or signs of the struggle that evidently did her in. Probably got jumped heading here or got pulled out into the hall if she opened the door. No idea. Her place stank of stale cigarettes. 
If it wasn't for the end of the world zombie plague and getting her body torn apart, I swear lung cancer would have gotten her shortly. At the rate she chimneyed those fuckers, she had to have been at least a little cancerous. Physically, at least. Her personality had always been cancerous. Once I got inside and calmed myself a bit, I instantly remembered that my mom was a food hoarder. She was Italian, and Italians love to cook overly large meals. I knew she had canned goods out the wazoo. I headed into her kitchen and started flinging cabinets open and revealed a cornucopia of food. I actually did a fist pump when I saw she had cranberry relish. For some reason, I just love that shit, and when I saw it there, it struck me that I hadn't grabbed any at the store. She also had some food beeping in the microwave. All done and ready to eat. It was some day-old spaghetti with a meat sauce. I didn't realize I was hungry until I popped the button to open the microwave, but holy shit, it hit me then. I snagged a fork from the drawer and ate the whole plate standing in front of the sink. Yay, Mom. I quickly did the whole room-clearing deal to make sure the rest of the house was safe, and I saw a half-empty banana box on the floor of her closet, probably a leftover box from the move into here a few months ago. I would also like to make a short aside here and point out how useful and sturdy banana boxes are. Anyone who reads this, if you need a good sturdy box, go for the banana box. It's reliable and has handles. I dumped her shit out, took the box into the kitchen, and just took everything. I emptied all her canned goods and her freezer as well. She had ten of those frozen dinner meals, which I thought was pretty cool. Ironically, I had one of them for dinner earlier. Anyway, once I had the box filled with all her stuff, I knew I had to get out quick. If there were two zombies outside in this hallway alone, God only knows how many others there might be. I guess it makes sense that older people might have died ahead of the curve for normal deaths. Heart attacks from stress, strokes, or even just a natural death would have introduced a zombie to the building here, and if the older folks were nearby, it's not like they can run well to get away. Plus, they're not as able in defending themselves, so really, it's like a fish in a barrel for zombies. I figured I'd be best served by clearing my exit out of the building, then taking the box out. If I was jumped holding the box, I might drop it, cutting down on my reaction time, as well as possibly busting my banana box. And frankly, banana boxes are just too damn good to risk losing it. LOL. Oh, Christ, I just farted and it smells like pure evil. Fucking frozen dinner is giving me gas. Otis just got up and walked up the stairs to get away from me. I am awesome. I gotta crack a window. Be right back. Much better. Anyway, I checked the eye hole in the door and it looked clear. I slowly opened it and peered out in both directions, Sig at the ready. It looked clear in both directions, and it was also quiet. I propped the door open wide enough to push the box through with my foot, and I stepped out into the hall. Mom's body was still face down where she fell on top of me. Both the zombie bodies were still where they went down when I dropped them as well. Good shooting, I guess, on my part. I brought the Sig up and started my slow and smooth gait down the corridor. I had twenty feet or so to go straight to the four-way intersection, then a left to head out to the lobby area with the nurse's station in it. I made the first twenty feet clean with no contact, but when I took the left I nearly shit myself. Not like the farts I'm dropping tonight, I mean legit underwear-filling fecal slippage. The nurse's station looked like a motherfucking butcher's table. One of the nurses was slumped in the chair behind the counter, head all the way back with one of the elderly residents just going to town on her neck. You could clearly hear the gristle popping in the dead dude's mouth as he chewed his way through her throat. Horrible. I noticed that she was wearing the same style of shirt and pants as the woman who got decapitated outside my condo earlier that day. That confirmation kind of felt good. Lying on the floor in the middle of the lobby was a younger guy, probably mid-twenties, and dressed athletically. He was face down, and two more of the older folk zombies were lying on top of him, eating away. It was just gross. The smell alone, even from a solid fifteen feet away, was sickening. Entrails have a nasty smell. Earthy, a little like vomit as well, with some poo stench mixed in. Add to that the coppery tinge from all the blood, and it's enough to turn any appetite. Certainly almost made me hurl the spaghetti I just ate. Of course, as soon as I got within fifteen feet or so, the zombies either smelled me or saw me. I don't think they can smell, so I think they saw me or maybe heard me. The one already standing eating the nurse's neck was the closest and quickest to respond. 
I took a few steps in his general direction and squeezed off two rounds at his head. I remember the first round hit him squarely in the neck and punched a dark hole right where his Adam's apple was. The second hit him in the nose and he went down immediately. The other two zombies were pretty much jerked into motion from the sound of the gunshots. They were more or less in a prone position, though, and being older, they were slow to get up. Finishing them was easy. A few steps closer and two nine-millimeter shots put them down for good. I did a quick survey, saw nothing else between me and the glass exit doors, and decided to go back for my haul. Here's where I made my first few major mistakes of the day. I grabbed the box, stuck the SIG back in the holster, and started a slow creep back to the lobby. The hallway was clear for me, just like the first time, but as soon as I made the corner heading out to the lobby, I was nearly knocked over by the fucking nurse who had her neck eaten apart. I totally forgot to put one in her head before walking away. Somewhat fortunately, the banana box was between me and her when she kind of stumbled against it, and I was saved. I took a few steps back, dropped the box as gently as I could, drew the pistol, and popped one in her forehead. She fell so hard that her head nearly came disconnected from her spine. Really jarring visuals. Seriously, the image frequently haunts me. By that point, I realized there was another undealt-with body in the lobby. The kid. This guy was younger, too, so he would likely be quicker and stronger than these older folks. Not that the nurse was old, but she was kind of a big girl and not that young. I made the corner again, this time leaving the box behind so I could deal with the kid. As soon as I took the turn at the four-way, I could see he was getting to his feet, coming up slowly like he was a sore athlete doing push-ups. It was nasty, though, because his guts were coming apart underneath him. I made a snap decision to shoot him before he fully got to his feet. I took a few quick jogging steps at him and drew a bead on the back of his head as he was halfway up. Of course, that was when I realized my second great mistake. The gun clicked dry. I was like two feet from this fucking zombie, and my gun was empty. Tired now. I'll finish after my trip to the store tomorrow. Adrian. October 13th. The best laid plans of mice and men, right? I hate my fucking life. All right, so the maintenance dump truck I grabbed started fine. No problem. I gathered up my gas cans, the SIG, the shotgun, and my short sword. It's the smallest high-quality sword I own, and if possible, I would rather use that first. However, driving with a sword sheathed on your hip is really awkward. I totally can see why a cop would take a nightstick off their belt when driving. I wound up just tossing it on the seat beside me. So, I was up early to get down there, about 8 a.m. I'm pretty fortunate in that my girlfriend bought me one of those self-winding watches that always stay running as long as you're moving. You know, I bet there are a shitload of these watches that are going to run forever on the arms of zombies. How weird is that? So, I grabbed a good-sized bite to eat, frozen bagel with jelly, can of beans, and two glasses of OJ from Concentrate, and set off down the road to the gas station. The campus is pretty high in altitude relative to the valley we're situated next to. We're almost on a plateau, really. What that means is our road, well, I guess it's just my road now, is pretty steep going downhill and has a few ups and downs. The truck made it about two miles before it started hiccuping and coughing and came to a halt. I pulled over after the power steering died, which, if you've never done it, is a pretty Herculean task. Turned the key off, tried to start it, and it tried real hard, but it just sputtered and died. Lather, rinse, repeat a few times, and still, dead truck. So, I had to make a decision. Walk back and scrap the trip, or walk back, get truck number one, and do it with that one. I'd be missing out on a lot of fuel doing it that way, but at the very least, it'd be a recon mission. I decided to do that. I got out into the cold morning air and immediately felt some burning fury and frustration. This shit always seems to happen to me. Always the crap that should never go wrong, goes wrong. I should have expected this shit. I started a slow jog. I had two miles, mostly uphill, and I didn't want to gas out on this unnecessary and unexpected jog. I paced myself, and everything was fine, until I got to the nice Cape home that's about a half a mile from campus. It was on the right side of the road, set back about fifty feet, with a long, curved driveway. It had lovely cream-colored siding and a very nice veranda connecting the garage to the main house. It also had two zombies meandering in the yard, one in the wilting center flower garden 
and one right in front of the garage. I only noticed them because I happened to stop jogging right next to the house and glanced absently sideways. Had I not stopped, I would have jogged right past them. Well, they sure as shit noticed me. When I finally took them in, they were both shuffling with their stiff, clumsy walk at me, arms sweeping, feet dragging. My cursory examination of them pegged them as a couple. Probably the snooty people who own this 300k house here in the hills. The guy had a sweater vest, for Christ's sake. I can only imagine the prick he was in life. Fashion notwithstanding, they were a threat, and they were moving pretty good. Their yard tilted to the road, and I think they were building steam coming downhill at me. Of course, maybe I was just scared shitless. I brought up the shotgun, racked up a shell, and was about to drop Mom when I realized I really didn't want to waste rounds or make noise. I slung the shotgun once I figured I had time to use the sword, which I put on my belt when I left the truck. I drew the sword and entered into an old-fashioned ass-whooping. Zombies don't block or dodge or anything, so it's not a fair fight if you just keep your spacing. They have no sense of self-preservation. I took off her right arm with a backswing at the elbow, sending her into a wobbling tailspin. Once she stumbled to a stable upright position, I snapped the sword two-handed right into her neck. Now, let me clear something up for the uninitiated. Beheading someone isn't easy. There's a lot of muscle, cartilage, bone, sinew, and jazz in the neck, and unless you have a heavy-duty axe or a big sword, it's fucking work to chop a head off. Certainly not like in the movies, where a cavalier swing sends the head flying and a gout of blood fountaining from the neck. It goes without saying, I didn't get it on the first swipe. However, my strike was pretty high on the neck, and it crushed her jaw completely, as well as knocking her to the ground. She landed face down, and a curb stomped her head from behind. She twitched a few times, and I moved away to address Wally. I was assuming at some point I would find the zombie beaver shortly. Wally was a good five feet away when I came down with both hands on the base of his neck, where it meets the shoulder. The sword sunk in a solid six inches and lodged in the top of the rib cage. I think. It didn't kill him, but it gave me a solid handle on his movement. I used the grip of the sword to twist him down onto his back, where I kicked his head repeatedly until he stopped moving. Once I felt reasonably safe, I got the sword free and stabbed him in the eye. I know this shit is grody, but... I'm recording history for posterity, so fuck you if you're sensitive or offended. Wally and June were down. I gave the area a once-over and saw it was clear, and I also saw their garage door was open. Inside said garage was a gigantor pickup truck, a Tundra gunmetal gray. I slid into the garage quietly, making sure that it was empty, and checked the truck. Quarter tank, keys in the ignition. I gave it a quick once-over and then reached inside to start it. It turned over immediately and sounded smooth. No hiccups. Smooth. Fuck walking back for truck number one. This would work, and I'd make do. I took the sword off, hopped in, adjusted the seat, and backed out. In the rearview mirror, I caught a brief glimpse of a kid running out behind the truck, and I jerked the brakes. I heard a thunking noise, and my heart dropped. I just hit a kid. After killing the kid's undead parents. Fuck my life. I was exhausted, frustrated, and suddenly racked with tremendous guilt. I powered the window down and leaned out to look back. I saw a little girl, maybe ten years old, laying splayed out behind the truck. I dropped my head on the window frame, and my mouth dried up. I looked again, though, and the kid sat back up and was coming to her feet. It didn't take much for me to figure out she'd been a zombie a while. Her cheek was missing, teeth showing through, and her skin was a super alabaster color. I was actually relieved to see she was a zombie. I threw the truck into reverse again and lined up the tires to run her over. There was a bump, a crunch, and a giant stain left behind in the driveway. With a clear conscience, I drove down the road off to my original destination. I stopped at the original truck and grabbed the gas cans before heading all the way down the hill. The road was just as clear of cars as it always has been, but there were quite a few tree branches down in the road. Rather than clear them out of the way, I just drove carefully around them. I didn't want to clean the road out too much for two reasons. First, it's shit a zombie can trip up on. That's saying something, too. These fuckers can get entirely bamboozled by simple obstacles like that. I once watched a zombie walk straight forward for 15 minutes stuck in a playground swing. Damn swing was up around its armpits, and it just kept going forward. Probably still there right now. And secondly, any survivors might think a cleared-out road leads to salvation, 
and I wasn't sure I wanted roommates just yet. Call me selfish if you want, but I'm fucking pragmatic, so suck it. I crept up to the stop sign around the corner from the gas station. Old habits die hard, and I came to a complete stop, mostly just to check out the surroundings, but traffic safety has always been a pet peeve of mine, too. I could clearly see movement inside the two houses across the street from the gas station. It was slow movement, deliberate, and a little clumsy. Pretty sure it was zombies. I counted at least six different shapes moving in the windows. I figured they were stuck inside and wouldn't be a problem. I slipped into the main road and drove the last hundred feet at about five miles an hour. The gas station lot was clear, and the two open garage bays were void of movement. There was a body half under a car on a lift, but it looked pretty ravaged as I pulled up to the pump. I work like the military in situations like this. Clear the building first, then do your work. I hopped out, sheathed up the sword as I kept an eye out, and headed up the few steps into the front doors of the station. This station was a mom-and-pop shop, not a chain, and it looked like a house more than a franchise-style square building. I pushed the door open slowly and took a sniff. Always trust your nose. I've learned that. Dead bodies and zombies smell wretched, especially if they're in an enclosed space for a long time. The interior of the gas station actually smelled pretty good. It smelled a little moldy, maybe, dusty for sure, but no rot in the air at all. I stepped in once I felt comfortable. I move with purpose. I'm quick, assertive, and have good violence of action. Look that phrase up. It's good shit if you don't know what it means. I cleared the main store area, which consisted of four chest-high aisles, and the back room, which was just a glorified janitor's closet. There was one exit in the back room area, but it led upstairs to the apartment above. I didn't feel the need to go up there at the moment, so I left it shut. No power was on. I checked the cooler doors and immediately wished I hadn't. The milk inside had gone rancid, and the stench was overwhelming. I actually panicked for a second because it was almost the same as a ripe zombie. It wasn't, though. All was safe for the moment. I immediately grabbed a handful of plastic bags from behind the counter and started filling them with everything I could see. My main items of note were pretty fucking outstanding— Soda, chips, and candy. I hadn't had shit like this since the world ended, and it was long since overdue. Energy drinks, coffee cans, sealed juices so stocked up with preservatives they were good until the next apocalypse, and a whole bunch more of the good old canned sustenance. I filled four bags at a time and made a trip to the truck, setting them gently in the back. Once I'd filled the bed of the tundra with bags, I searched for the keys to open the pumps. Nada. I looked for a solid fifteen minutes, but found jack shit. Eventually, I saw the body outside in the garage again and figured I'd check the pockets. I felt pretty safe checking the corpse because the head was crushed by some parts that had fallen off the car. It looked like the whole ass end of the car had come loose and crushed him. He was also pretty fresh compared to the bodies I've seen from the first of the zombie days. I wonder now if he was trying to fix the car to mount an escape. Anyway, he had the keys in his pocket, and it only took a minute or two to get the pump door open and get the manual handle set in it. It only took me three rotations to get fuel coming out the nozzle. Like an asshat, though, I didn't put the truck on the right side for the gas cap. I filled the four gas cans, though, and then pulled a quick U-turn, switching the truck around. As soon as I pulled into the pump again and got out, I heard the car coming. Frankly, I panicked. Hide, just stand there, get the gun ready. My decision was made for me, though, when the car crested the little hill and drove by me. They stomped on their brakes, though, and stopped the car right in the road. It was an import station wagon. Volvo, Subaru, I don't remember right at the moment. A woman was driving, and a young guy was in the passenger seat. The car sat still in the road for a solid minute before the dude got out of the passenger side. He had a big, scruffy nap of hair that looked like a badly trimmed beard that ran into an afro, and he was wearing a heavy flannel shirt and jeans. Reminded me of a hippie crossed with a logger. Funny stuff. He hopped out of the car and just stood there, looking at me. I waved slowly and rested my hand on the sig at my waist. I could see he had a shotgun inside the car, set in the door frame and within easy reach. I forget exactly what he said after our moment of awkward silence, but it was something like this. Uh, hey dude, you okay? Y you need help? And I said, I'm fine, thanks. Uh, you two okay? He seemed genuinely concerned, so my guard came down a little. After I said that, he replied, "'There's actually three of us. We've got our son, too. He's only three. I remember vividly him looking in the back seat of the car, and I could kind of see a car seat. "'Do you have any food? We need food for him. We've been looking, but we're low on bullets, and it's hard to get into stores that way, you know?' 
I took my time answering him. This place is cleared out. It's safe. I thumbed at the gas station behind me. I actually left a bunch of baby food in there, too. I've got some stuff in the truck here you can have, too. Just hang on and I'll dig it out. I carefully watched his response to that. And honestly, he started to tear up and smile ear to ear. He could barely get it out, but he muttered something like, Oh my God, thank you so much, man. That made me feel good. I rooted around in the truck, emptied a bag, and refilled it with stuff I knew I had plenty of back at the school. I also felt good because turning the truck around faced me in the opposite direction of the road I would be heading towards when I left. It's a small detail, but it might point them in the wrong direction. As I did this, the guy asked politely if he could go in the shop, and I nodded. I kept my facing so I could see him and his wife, who was turned in her seat to watch the events unfold. About the same time I got done repacking a good-sized bag for them, he came out with two bags himself. I handed the bag to him, nodded, wished him good luck, and his lip trembled in response. He had tears streaming down into his face. It was then I noticed how filthy and skinny he was, gaunt almost. He backed away, put the food in his car, got in, and they drove away. I gave it a minute to digest everything, then got the pump running and filled the tundra. According to the pump, I put about twenty gallons in the trunk. Pretty good haul for a Plan C. I checked the pump's tank capacity numbers, and it looked like there was over three thousand gallons of fuel left in the two tanks. Plenty to go me quite some time, the whole winter at the very least. I did a quick last-second check of the garage and found a five-gallon fuel tank. Score, right? I walked out to the pump, and immediately my stomach dropped. The wagon was back, and Mom was outside it, coming across the road straight at me, handgun raised in my general direction. She looked loony. Nonverbal aggression commonly escalates things. Threatening posture, physical motion, all that stuff. I just slowly lowered my arms to my side as non-threateningly as I could and let her come to me. I could see she was pretty detached from reality and was crying just like her husband was just minutes earlier. Her hands were shaking something fierce as she brought the gun to my chest level and stopped at the back of my new truck. We need more food and gas and water, too. I don't want to shoot you, but I'll do it for my son. We can't go on being nice anymore. I'm so sorry. She got the sorry out as more of a guttural choke than a word. I could tell what she was trying to say, though. You could see her pleading with her eyes. I forget exactly what I said at that point, but it was reassuring her that there was plenty of food and water as well as food, and I was more than willing to share it. She motioned for her husband to come out, and he did. You could feel the fear coming off him, though. He clearly wanted no part of armed robbery, and it was palpable. He gave her a wide berth as he reached into the truck and grabbed two of my bags of groceries. I pointed out, too, that I knew had good food in them. He nodded frighteningly in thanks to me as his wife continued to shake with fear and anxiety. I stayed as calm as I could, but things got worse when she started yelling at him to grab more. I knew I could go without this stuff, so I wasn't about to get in a gunfight with a young mother and father over some candy bars. However, the young man was willing to argue with her over it. They started screaming and crying, and she started gesturing wildly, trying to get the point to him that they were going to die if they didn't take all my newfound food. It was about that point I saw the zombie across the street moving towards their open car door and their little kid. Sternly, not loud, but certainly audible, I simply said, zombie. Her gun went off. I don't know if the sound of my voice did it, or if she was trying to shoot the zombie, or what, but her pistol went off. Her husband dropped like a rock, clutching his chest. The plastic bags filled with food dropped at his side and tipped over. She wailed at a thousand decibels and dropped on top of him, screaming she was sorry. I took a few steps to my left, got a clean angle on the corpse walking towards her car, and fired a single round, splitting its face in two. It fell in the road a few steps from her open car door. Dimly, I could hear the kids start to cry inside the car. I put the cig away and went to the guy to attend to him. Immediately, I regretted not bringing a first aid kit. I tried calming her down, but in the end, I had to shove her off of him to check his situation. For being a total shit show with a gun, she hit him dead square in the left lung. I could hear his chest gurgling when I put my ear to it, and his entry wound was starting to bubble and froth outward. His breathing was becoming more and more labored, and his mouth was filling with blood. He had a hole in his lung, and he would die. He would have no last words. You gotta get out of here. He won't make it, and he'll try and kill you when he comes back. She sobbed, staring at me like I wasn't even there. 
I took action and loaded the bags of groceries her husband had dropped into the back seat of their car. Like I said, I didn't need it. I just wanted it. I did glance at the little guy in the car seat, though. Despite the fact that he was screaming in fear, he was a handsome baby. If they survived, he'd be a good-looking boy, suitable to be proud of. She was sobbing still, but her breathing was controlled. I picked up her pistol and glanced around. No more zombies visible. I got her up off the ground, brushed her hair back to clear her eyes, and looked her straight up. I'll take care of him. Now you need to go take care of your son. She nodded weakly in response and walked back to her car. I dropped the clip in the pistol, ejected the round into my hand, and loaded it back into the clip quickly, flicked the safety on, and handed it to her as she shut her door. I'm sorry, she said. Me too. And the woman and her three-year-old handsome boy drove off. Once I felt comfortable about them being far enough off, I walked back over to her fallen husband. He was just starting the twitches that come right before the reanimation. I slid the sword out and sunk it in one of the eyes that, not minutes before, were crying in gratitude for the small good deed I'd done for him and his family. I never got their names. Adrian. October 18th. It bothers me a great deal that I had to watch a wife kill her husband so I could get a fucking candy bar. The state of affairs of this shitty-ass world now has my head in shambles. It's Monday. The weather blows. It's cold, rainy, and raw. Typical fall weather for around here. I'm still recovering from my jaunt to the gas station on Wednesday. Physically, I was unharmed, despite running into three full-on zombies, one lunatic wife, and one freshly attempting to reanimate body. I went maybe six miles round trip, and I ran into all that. What the fuck is downtown like? Baghdad of the living dead? Christ's sake. I got back Wednesday at like one in the afternoon, I think. I didn't check my watch exactly. I got the tundra to the dorm, backed it right up to the door as close as I could, and got the groceries inside. I took the gas cans down to the basement where the generator is and left most of them in an adjacent room. Outside chance the generator blows up, I didn't want gas cans nearby. I also took one of the gas cans down to the maintenance shed so that, just in case, all the gasoline wasn't in one place. Always have a plan B, right? The rest of that day I basically vegetated. Damn near grew roots. I was so fucking pissed I could barely see straight. I had this awesome habit when I was younger of punching things when I lost my temper. I couldn't even tell you how many times my older brother and my dad had to patch the drywall in our house growing up. Fist holes in walls were available wholesale when I was going through puberty. I was almost that mad that day. I found solace in candy. Don't judge me. I have a hardcore sweet tooth and this was the first chocolate I'd had in months. I didn't think to grab any on any of my trips out or on that day, so I was pretty stoked to have some finally. I gorged and ate three candy bars. Sugar Joy alleviated my tension. Otis, too. He always knows when I'm down. The days leading up to today have been pretty quiet. Thursday, when I woke up, I was kind of sore, which is pretty normal for a day after the one I just had. Despite not getting hurt, really, when you're all adrenalized, you can sometimes hurt yourself a little just being in a fight. I think I swung the sword so powerfully I actually strained my shoulders. So I took four ibuprofen and a break and read a few books out of the library all weekend. Our library here is the majority of the second floor of the main schoolhouse. There's about 16 classrooms in it, eight on the first floor and eight more on the third. Second floor is all library, though. I need to be really practical right now, though, so my readings are more or less limited to trying to pick up usable skills. I stuck to gardening and agricultural texts this weekend. I know I need to plant the seeds I got, but frankly, I don't know shit about farming. After this weekend's reading, I now know shit about farming. Not much about it, but some. I did read this neat book about growing stuff in your apartment so you could have fresh produce in the city, and I desperately want to put that into action. If I can score a few bags of potting soil and the pots to go with it, I think I can get some stuff growing here in the dorm over the winter. But... It's been five days since I last touched this journal, Mr. Journal, and I think I still have a lot of story left to put down in the annals of history, such as it is. The last part I remember I talked about was when I was at my mother's place and my gun clicked dry. I'd walked up behind the younger zombie that was face down, but getting up, leaving his entrails on the floor as he did so. I was close enough that I was really almost at his feet when the gun clicked empty. I can totally remember that sharp pang of fear hitting me square in the pit of my stomach. What? The fuck. I backpedaled a few feet and watched in horror as the kid kind of 
rolled over and started to come at me. I looked around the lobby to see if there were any weapons, but there was nothing visible. I took another couple steps back and thought about how having the Glock would have been so much better. The Glock I wanted had a higher magazine capacity, and I would have been good to go. Phil to the motherfucking rescue. I reached into my pants cargo pocket on the left side and grabbed the spare mag Phil had hooked me up with earlier that day. I dropped the empty and slid the full one in and thumbed the slide forward. Calmly, and with relative precision, I snapped two rounds at the undead mess coming at me. First round sailed a little high and hit it in the back, but the second round split his forehead clean. His brains flew out the exit wound and covered his back with bloody gray poop. My heart was fucking pounding hard, so hard it actually hurt a little. I can recall the uncomfortable doubt of wondering whether or not I was having a heart attack. I wasn't, though. Panic attack, maybe. Once I gathered myself and got my heart to slow down some, I grabbed my empty clip off the floor and went back carefully to grab my banana box. All was clear this time, and I got the fuck out. I tossed the banana box in the back seat and got in. Once I got the door locked, I snagged a box of 9mm and reloaded my empty clip. I also filled up the chamber and two rounds I shot out of the new clip. I hate to admit it, but that ass Phil totally saved my bacon with that second clip. Phil, if you're out there, I take back all all the bad things I have ever said about you. You have earned your passage to heaven in my book, sir. Still on my agenda was checking on my friends. The rest of my family was long since out of the question. Dad had been dead for some time, my older brother Caleb lived right in the city, and my younger sister Rebecca was away at college, which was on the other side of the city. No chance for a rescue for either of them, at least not that day. I guess it's ironic that I actually thought about the logistics of driving all the way through the city to get to Rebecca but not 45 minutes to find Cassie. I don't even know what to say about that. I guess I'm a total fucking scumbag. Anyway, earlier I mentioned that I wanted to check in on Steve, my co-worker buddy, and my two friends John and Dorothy. It was getting dark at this point, though, and I really wanted to get a move on. I knew for one that Steve was probably either A, doing just fine, or B, not home anyway, so I knew, or at least had a good feeling, I wouldn't be long at his place. I switched my destination order immediately. I think it was about 6.30 or so by that point, and it was half dark. I had until maybe 7 or so before I'd be in the dark. I left my mother's place moving a little faster than the speed limit and headed past the school. The school's parking lot was still packed. I didn't know why then, and I still don't know why now, but my bet was there was some kind of parent-teacher conference that night or a basketball game or something. The kids would have been out of school for hours by that point, so it didn't make sense that this was a rush of parents getting their kids. I couldn't get involved anyway. I almost got sideswiped by some prick in a Prius, though, as I drove by the exit. It was close, but no damage done. I hit Main Street and headed straight east the eight miles to John and Dorothy's place. Now, I said it was out of town, and it is. Their place is a few hundred feet down a side road off a fairly well-traveled state route. It's rural, pleasant, and was a bitch to get to. The roads were packed big time that day, and everyone was flying. I got passed at least 20 times on a solid yellow during the trip. No middle fingers given my way, though, which was a pleasant change of pace from the prick earlier in the giant truck. I got off the main route without getting the car wrecked and turned onto the street John and Dorothy lived on. No traffic here, just trees and darkness, as the sun had fully set by now. Now, before I go any further, I should mention my buddy John was a bit of a gun nut. That's being fairly mild. He was ex-army, just like me. I did four years, he did eight but he came from a long and storied lineage of deer hunters. He spent far more money getting his hunting rifles geared up than he did on his cars. Funny that he drove a $900 pickup truck with a $3,000 hunting rifle in the back window. Only in America, I guess. Good times. Classy fellow, though. He just really enjoyed firearms and spending time in the woods with them. I turned left super slow into their driveway and came to a stop about 15 feet from their garage door. Lights were on in the living room, but I didn't see anyone. John's truck wasn't visible, and Dorothy's little beater car was nowhere to be seen either. I let myself out of the car and made sure I had the SIG and the spare clip on me. No sword, though. Shit was crazy enough without me marching into their place with it. I knocked on the door they used as the front, which was on the breezeway that attached the garage to the house. More of a mudroom, really, than a breezeway. I waited a full minute while looking into the window next to me. It looked into their living room, and with the light on inside, I could see everything. No one came to the door, so I tried the knob, and it was unlocked. Remember earlier how I said to trust your nose? 
As soon as I opened the door, I got a whiff of something awful, something bloody and dead or dying. I drew the pistol out of instinct and walked slowly into the mudroom. Stretching across the floor from the back door opposite my door to the interior door heading into the house was a crimson streak of blood. It wasn't a huge swath of blood, but it came from a serious bleeding injury. A bit of dread hit me. I can remember it clearly. I hoped it wasn't either John or Dorothy, or especially their four-year-old Danielle. Shit, if that kid died, I think I would go loony on the spot. The door heading inside was ajar, and I used the muzzle of the pistol to push it open fully. The streak of blood continued through the living room, past the central fireplace, and down the hall. It looked like it ended right at the bathroom door halfway down their hallway. I decided then and there to clear the house as normal. I went room to room, carefully, cautiously, using standard room-clearing military procedure. Living room and kitchen were both clear. Both closets were empty, but when I cleared the bathroom, I saw where the blood was coming from. Before I went in to examine more fully, I cleared the bathroom at the end of the hall and crept upstairs to clear the other two bedrooms. The house was totally empty. I noticed in both of the bedrooms where they slept, the bureau drawers were pulled out and gone through. Clothes were also missing from the closets. I returned to the bathroom and the source of the blood. In the tub, dead as a doornail, was their family dog, Dwayne. John loved Dwayne Wade and named his dog after him. I can't fault him. Dwayne, the dog, not the basketball player, was his homeboy just like Otis was mine. Can't be hating. Honestly, I was relieved. I'd started to think the streak came from their kid, Danielle, and when I knew it wasn't, I was so relieved. I did, however, remember that John kept his gun safe downstairs. I flicked the lights on and went down to clear the basement. Everything was kosher, though, and I found the safe door open. All the guns were gone. However, he did leave behind two packages of gun kit cloth, which is disposable stuff, and I knew I would eventually need more. And he also left behind two full boxes of 12-gauge double lot. That was 20 more shotgun shells for me. Huzzah! I checked the basement for anything I could take and found little. There were some tools, which I already could get, and some cleaning supplies, but those would be in major motherfucking abundance at the school, so I skipped the basement. In the kitchen upstairs, though, I found about ten cans of food they left behind, as well as a few boxes of crackers and a bag of chips. God bless John and his obsessive love for Cool Ranch Doritos. I was now hood-rich with four bags. I did get a scare, though, when I looked out the window above the sink. In the backyard, barely visible in the light shining out of the window, I could see a person standing near the back fence. They were just standing there, and I can remember feeling really creeped out. I mean, who the fuck just stands in somebody's backyard? Dorothy have a stalker or something? I figured I'd look into it. I gathered my shit in a few brown paper bags Dorothy had under the counter and carefully exited the house, going to my car. All clear. I tossed the stuff in the back and grabbed the Mossberg. Rather than go through the mudroom area, I opted for walking around the garage outside. It was getting chilly now that the sun had been down and gone for a bit, but it wasn't cold at all. I kept the gauge at my shoulder and peeked slowly around the back corner of the garage. In profile, lit without any glare from inside the window, it clearly was a dead guy. Well, mostly dead. One of the freshly risen. I crept across the backyard very quietly and made it to within about twelve feet of the zombie, but I accidentally punted one of Danielle's toys right at the fucking zombie. I think it was a little plastic playset for a farm or something. Weebles went everywhere as the barn silo bricked off the dead guy's head. Hey, if anything, I'm funny. The zombie pervert turned abruptly and made a lunge in my direction. I popped off three shots in rapid succession at him and ended his ass quickly. Note to the uninitiated. Aiming with a shotgun is a relative thing. It's like horseshoes. Close is frequently good enough. One of the three shots hit him in the neck, I think, because his head just vaporized off his shoulders. I got a bit of warm spray to the face, which made me retch a little. I grabbed a shirt or something off the laundry line in the yard to wipe my face. Grossness anywhere else I think I can cope with, but keep the gore from my mouth. Seriously, it's fucking nasty and completely unfucking necessary. Filth off my face, I made my exit stage right. I'm not sure, but I think that zombie must have killed Dwayne, the dog, not the basketball player. Makes sense, at least. I have no idea where he came from, of course, nor will I ever, but I find myself trying to make sense of this shit as time passes. 
I do have a lot of spare time to kill. The mind wanders. So, that was John and Dorothy's place. Empty, save for a few bits of food, some extra shotgun shells, one pervert zombie, and a dead dog. Next stop, Steve's place. More on that clusterfuck in the next entry, Mr. Journal. Stay safe. Adrian. October 20th. I've been laughing about this since I left off on the journal a couple days ago. After the quasi-debacle at John and Dorothy's, I left for my friend Steve's place. Steve actually lived near where I lived in town. It was more or less downtown, a little closer to the center than my place, so I was worried about the condition of the world there. How shitty would downtown be? I would soon find out. Aside from the story, Tuesday was solid. Nothing happened here on campus, and today was good, too. It's still kind of damp and cold out, but the rain has subsided. Feels like it's getting a little warmer out. So, the drive to Steve's place was something like six miles from John and Dorothy's place. I got back on the state route heading towards town and was sort of surprised at the lack of traffic. Well, the lack of traffic heading in the direction I was going. Cars headed east were practically tailgating at 80 miles per hour, but heading west, it was dead. That stands to reason, though, is... Heading east dumped them onto the interstate, which would take them either to the more populated areas or up north, where it's pretty sparsely populated. I ran the stop sign at the end of their street, by the way, which kind of bothers me to this day. Foolish risk, really. The drive to Steve's apartment was smooth. No traffic accidents, no bullshit. One of the things that I actually had to laugh about was I finally figured out how to turn off the goddamn CD I had playing and turn off the radio. Don't get me wrong— I'd been kind of enjoying my end-of-the-world day to the soundtrack of Eminem, but I needed info now. I listened to the radio so infrequently it just didn't occur to me that I had a media option to listen to. When I did listen to the radio, I usually listened to NPR, so when I switched, that's what I got. I forget the exact details, but the radio reports were really bad. I guess things had gotten dramatically worse since I'd last watched the boob tube or checked the internet. Hospitals were flooded during the day with people who were sick or injured, or who thought they were sick. Of course, it took some hours to get things sorted out, and in the meantime, lots and lots of people got bitten or killed outright. That spread the disease. With the medical infrastructure totally fucked within eight hours, things went from bad to worse. In a non-stressful environment, there are shit-tons of car accidents, work accidents, home accidents, etc., Imagine how many extra accidents happened that day, and in many cases, from the sounds of it, no ambulances arrived to help. And if they did come, they probably took you to an epicenter of the plague, or whatever you want to call this. If you haven't figured it out by now, Mr. Journal, shit was terrible by this point. Little to no medical care to be had anywhere. Hospitals and clinics were unsafe, as were the body collection areas they tried to set up. NPR said something like, 5,000-plus cases of bite attacks were reported in New York State that afternoon alone. Can you imagine the fallout there? It had to be exponential. I listened intently the whole drive to Steve's place. I was really hoping to find him there, not only to make sure he was safe and good to go, but also I was hoping to drag him along to the school as a fellow survivor. He's a hell of a guy to have around, if only for comedic purposes. Downtown was amazingly sedate. Very few cars moving around at this point, and a lot of darkness. The street lights were still on, and all the businesses were still lit, but I think those all operate on automatic lights. That, or whoever was there, went peace out and left everything on. What was dark, though, were the house lights. A lot of the houses were boarded up, and a lot were probably empty. I also imagine a lot had their lights off to avoid attracting any attention. The thought of all the people huddled up in the dark was fucking creepy. Steve's place is in one of the handfuls of small apartment complexes in town. We have weird ordinances here that prevent apartment buildings over two stories, so there aren't that many. We do have lots of old multifamily homes instead. Anyway, Steve's place consisted of four brick and shingle buildings arranged in a square with a central parking lot just off a street that's perpendicular to Main Street. Each building had a single entrance with a central hall and stairway linking all four apartments. Steve's place was on the second floor of the building closest to the street. Honestly, if Steve could block off and secure the central doors on the first floor, his place would be sweet to hole up in. Pretty secure. 
When I pulled in, I scanned the parking lot for movement. It was well lit, and I could see maybe a half dozen folks putting shit in their cars, frantically. Seemed pretty safe, all things considered. I pulled right up to the curb in front of his place and got out. I took the shotgun with me. I hit the buzzer for Steve's place, but there was no answer. I hit it again and waited another minute or two, but zilch. This was normal for Steve. Steve's couch was his close, close friend, and often you had to text him to get him to answer his buzzer. His priorities were a little different than most, you could say. He always figured, fuck the doorbell, everyone he knew that was coming over would text him anyway. Random doorbells were probably Jehovah's Witnesses or Girl Scouts trying to sell a product that wasn't a piece of ass. Hence, no interest, and thus, no answer of the door. Pretty luckily, though, one of his neighbors, a cute chick that I think he originally moved into the building to try and fuck, came out just then. She blew right past me like I was a fucking lamp. No eye contact, no hello, nada. <laughs> Women. End of the world, and I can't even get a phone number. I wonder if Steve ever got to fuck her. Seems like a little bit of a waste if he didn't. Anyway, I slipped inside after she left and went upstairs to his place. I found a note taped to his door, carefully handwritten with a little smiley at the end of it. I kept it, and here it is in all its glory. Spelling and grammar errors are original, and all courtesy of Steve. To whom it may concern. If you are reading this, you are either concerned for my well-being, or about to loot my house. If the latter be the case, have at. I left my broken laptop on top of my bed, and that's about as good as it's going to get for you. If you fall under the categories of being concerned for my well-being, have no worries. I am on top of my game. I've always wanted to have the playing field leveled, and for better or worse, this whole end-of-the-world thing has done just that. So I figure, while everyone else is panicking or hiding or just shitting their pants, I'm going to go get the bends I always wanted. I'll be occasionally coming back into town to check on my parents at the Davis family compound. Who would have thought that my father's ludicrous paranoia would have set him in the perfect position to survive the end of the world? I am never going to hear the end of it from him. Anyway, since cell service is gone, I finally have a reasonable excuse to use a CB radio and can be reached on Channel 10 around noon every day if you're in my vicinity. Much love, Steve. Lols. Off to the school I went. Adrian. October 25th. Ten zombie facts for the uninitiated. One. Zombies are almost entirely silent save for the noise they make while shuffling around. Use your vision and sense of smell to notice them. 2. While slow moving, they never seem to tire. Running and frequently taking right angles seems to allow you to escape them. They do not corner well. Great on the flats, though. 3. Only wounds that damage the brain seem to drop them for good. Aim for the head or neck with your firearms or melee weapons. Remember, circling a single zombie works well. They turn around for shit. 4. They are weaker than you, and are unable to pull themselves up. If you can change elevation, they usually cannot continue their pursuit. This also works if you can trip them. They frequently lay there for seconds trying to figure shit out, and then it takes them time to get upright. Plenty of time to either kill them or flee. 5. Zombies appear to have excellent hearing. They're attracted to movement as well, so if you can be quiet and stay very still, there's a good chance they will not notice you. 6. Zombies only eat the flesh of their victims so long as they are moving around. Once the person is dead and stops moving, the zombies stop eating and pursue their next victim. Watch this happen several times now, and I'm not sure what the deal is. 7. Zombies do not bleed. They ooze a thick, blood-like goo. 8. Zombies trip on just about anything in their way. If you can put obstacles in their way, most of them cannot wrap their decaying heads around how to get past it quickly. Eventually they'll figure it out, but if you can get out of their line of sight and out of their hearing range, they'll give up and meander elsewhere. 9. It seems like they tend to hang out wherever it is that they died. Some wander about, especially if they hear or see something go by. What this means, though, is that where people died, there are huge concentrations of the undead. Hospitals are like irradiated zones for danger. 10. Lastly, but not least, zombies don't seem to be decaying at a normal rate. Not sure why, but it seems like once reanimated, if they stay that way for any substantial length of time, say a week or more, 
they just kind of mummify. If you kill a freshly risen body, though, it decays as normal. I think the zombification factor may build up some form of preservation effect. I'm not a scientist, just taking a stab in the dark. Adrian October 27th What a weird day. It's hot out, and it's almost November. The thermometer on the tree outside says it's 72 degrees. Normally, not what you would consider hot, but the humidity is really uncomfortable. I am really missing air conditioning right now. Today's Wednesday. My last meaningful entry was last Wednesday, so I've been slacking. Of course, I only set out to put occasional entries into you, Mr. Journal, but I guess I've been enjoying getting all these memories out. Well, that and putting down some of the everyday details I'm experiencing here on campus. It's actually been helpful in keeping myself more organized, I must say. I definitely have been more cognizant of the passage of time, amongst other things. Not sure what I feel like talking about right now, really. I know I've got a lot left to write about in terms of the trip to get to the school here that day, but I'm not sure I feel like writing about that. Maybe. Let's take a stream-of-consciousness approach and see what my fingers type out. Maybe I'll get there. This past week has been uneventful. The weather's been shitty since my last entry, so I've been both down in the dumps as well as unmotivated to do much. Otis has reaped the benefits of me being inside, though. He's gotten a pretty excessive amount of attention this week. They haven't achieved shit around campus otherwise. I do two patrols a day now, where I walk around the buildings and check the bridge to make sure no zombies or stragglers are wandering about. All week, I saw nothing. I really think this was a great choice to hole up in, even if I almost died hardcore trying to get it safe to live in. Oh, fuck it. You win. I'll tell more of that story. All righty, then. I think it was around... 7.45 or so, when I finally got out of Steve's place and headed out of town to the school here. As I said before, the houses were all dark, and the roads had calmed themselves down to a nearly empty point. I made good time down the side streets, and finally out to the outskirts of town, towards the school. I did make one last quick pit stop at the second-to-last convenience store going out of town. Not the one I just got the gas from, one a few miles away from that one. I hit the gas pump and topped off my tank. Fortunately, the automated ATM charging dealie at the pump was still working, so I didn't have to go inside. The clerk watched me with intent worry the whole time I was pumping. She was just a little girl, really, maybe 18 years old. She kept her eyes peeled on the road the whole time, and she scrammed when a car pulled in for her. I think I might have weirded her out, because the whole time I pumped, I held the shotgun and stood vigilant. What a different world just a few hours of nightmare can create, right? So, once I topped off, I got back in and skedaddled. I passed a few more cars than would be considered normal on the road that leads directly to the school here. You can always tell when there's a shift change because the employees and parents are always coming and going at the same time. It's like a school of fish moving in concert at all times. This time, though, it was all expensive, snooty cars booking it out. Easy guess was that the rich parents who shipped their kids off to the school were picking them up to take them away. I couldn't make out all the plates in the dark, but a few I did see were from out of state. So, up until that point, my assumption had been that campus would be a quiet place where I could set up shop pretty easily that night. I could not have been much more wrong. I remember crossing the bridge to get into campus and saw half a dozen cars parked at the admissions house. In the little yard, I could see maybe ten folks all gesturing frantically, clearly agitated and alarmed. I pulled my car over, grabbed my sword and twenty-two, and got out to check the situation. Amy, one of the admissions women, was trying to calm down about eight parents. I took a roundabout path to come up sort of behind her, so I could not only back her up, but so I could also hear better what was going on. It was hysterical. I guess these parents couldn't find their kids. Anyone who has ever worked at a school, especially a private school, knows that missing kids are a big deal. I was listening intently while scanning the campus surroundings. Everything was a nightmare. I could see a handful of cars all clearly crashed into random places. A few crashed into the sides of buildings, a few into guardrails, and a few into parked cars. Not sure what caused the crashes, but you can use your imagination to figure that out. I could see other cars zipping through the campus, getting the fuck out as fast as they could, nearly hitting other cars and some students and staff doing the same thing. It was a solid minute, though, of silence before I realized that everyone had stopped talking and was staring at me. 
Amy had turned to face me, and the parents were giving me the stink eye. Rich fuckers. Amy's comment got a laugh out of me. What the fuck happened to you? I remember just shaking my head, confused at her. I had no idea what she was talking about. She was kind enough to point out my current blood-soaked clothing and generally disheveled appearance. I remember looking down and being shocked at my own appearance. I was fucking covered in zombie goo. I had streaks of blood all over my sweatshirt, my jeans, and apparently my face. I hadn't seen myself in a mirror all day. You know, in retrospect, it might have been the fact that I looked like a blood-soaked shotgun-toting maniac that the girl at the gas station was weirded out. Live and learn, I guess. I shook my head at her and told her it wasn't very good out there. I think I told her I had a long day. The parents looked mortified, and Amy not much different. She filled me in as the parents started to build up speed and fervor in their yelling again. From what she'd gathered, school had started as normal that day. Incidentally, that day was a Wednesday. As the first few hours went on, school officials realized shit was going down and entered into lockdown mode. The kids were sealed into a few of their classrooms with their teachers, and the campus was more or less shut down. Locking the students into classrooms caused a few problems that were unexpected. A few of our kids were diabetic and had insulin reactions or sugar attacks, as my grandfather used to call them. One of our kids had epilepsy, and apparently he had a seizure due to missing some meds. These problems just compounded everything, making it a very rough place to be. Some staff just plain old walk the fuck out. Can you blame them? If I were working that day, I would have been gone in a heartbeat. Parents started calling and streaming into the campus, causing total havoc. Most just kicked in random doors looking for their kids. Apparently, there had been many altercations throughout the afternoon between staff and parents, as well as parents and parents, and in three cases, someone had been hurt seriously, as in, would probably die. There was no emergency response to any of their 911 calls. I knew why. One of the parents arrived armed with a weapon only an hour prior and was taking it into his hands to rescue the kids. This guy seemed to be the one causing most of the trouble at the present. The parents were worried he would hurt more people. There was still one more pivotal fuck-up to this story. The eight parents here were trying to pick up eight kids that were still in a classroom locked down on the top floor of the main classroom building. Amy told me that our resident offbeat English teacher, Mrs. Goodell, had sealed the door shut, barred it, and wasn't allowing anyone in. Our intrepid armed hero parent was currently on his way to said classroom to, and this is a direct quote from Amy, fix this bitch. I think it goes without saying that someone who would say something like that is generally the kind of person who does less fixing of bitches and more totally fucking up of things. Amy also said that she had heard multiple gunshots over the last twenty minutes or so, heading in the general direction of the schoolhouse. No one there knew what to do. Well, Mr. Journal, I don't think of myself as a hero. It's my distinct belief that courage is not the lack of fear, but the will and fortitude to do what's necessary in spite of that fear. That night, I knew I had to make the campus safe, or I could be totally fucked over by this guy. I told Amy and the parents to get safe inside a car or the admissions building, and that I would take care of it. I was off to fix that bitch. Adrian Phil's Story Growing old is no fun. Ask anyone who's done a lot of it, and you'll find that out. Once you get to a certain age, you stop building up that head of steam that youth gives you, and you wind up starting to sputter out. The moments where you sputter out tend to come pretty regularly, too. They come after a long day at work, one when you've spent too much time on your feet, or they come to you when you've spent a little too much time horsing around with your two grandkids, who you adore more than life itself. For Phil Stevens, his moments came most often and most regularly when he woke up in the morning. Phil was fifty-eight years old and looked every moment of it. His hair was gray enough that you couldn't call it black any more, but just black enough that it looked disheveled no matter what he did to it. His wife Marcy had been on his ass for two years now about buying some of that Greekian formula, as she called it, to get back to at least one color. But Phil didn't give a shit any more. He just wanted to go to work, come home for a decent dinner, if possible play with his grandkids, and watch football on Sunday. Everything else was peanuts. 
Phil's creaking back tormented him all the way to the bathroom in his small house, where he downed a handful of arthritis pills. By the time he'd gotten done washing his crotch and feet, the pills were kicking in, and he started to feel like today could be a pretty good day. After toweling off, applying deodorant to his pits and balls, he put on his trusty Moore's Sporting Goods polo shirt and his khaki pants, his work uniform for the past sixteen years. His empty tummy and his nose told him that Marcy had the bacon and eggs ready and waiting, so after he got his shoes on, he shuffled his way into the kitchen and sat down to eat. Marcy was a big fan of the morning shows on all the big networks, so Phil and her put a small television set on the counter so she could watch them while she made breakfast every morning. Creatures of habit, these two. Phil grunted appreciatively at Marcy, spooned a thick wad of salsa on his scrambled eggs, and dug in. Marcy paid Phil no attention while he ate, which was unusual. Normally she sat down with him and ate her eggs beside him, always sunny side up on toast, but today she leant over the counter and was glued to the morning show she had on. "'Marcy, what's so interesting you letting your eggs get all cold for?' Phil spooned another mouthful of eggs in as he finished talking. "'Phil, I think something's wrong out there.' She didn't even turn to him to say it. That wasn't like her at all. "'Well, could you move so your husband can see what's so wrong?' He absently slid a whole piece of bacon into his mouth as he gestured for her to move aside. Marcy obliged immediately, still without taking her eyes off the television. She turned the volume knob on the old set up so Phil could hear it. So reports are now telling us that overnight in about eighty to one hundred locations there were very violent attacks by people who appeared to be on some form of sedatives or perhaps sick with some form of rabies. Authorities are unsure what the root is of this strange occurrence, but the global nature of the attacks has authorities on alert everywhere. The perfectly dressed and primped morning show host said in his mild baritone voice. The other host, this one a far too artificially beautiful blonde lady, chimed in and added, Well, Chuck, reports from Bangkok, Chicago, London, St. Petersburg, Bogota, and Sydney are all the same. These people are reaching a near-death catatonic state and then suddenly becoming violent, biting and scratching anyone near them. It's almost like one of those terrible zombie movies that have been so popular on late-night television lately. She giggled on the last delivery. The male news guy smiled awkwardly and played along with her joke. Authorities here in the United States are advising all people to be attentive to anyone acting suspicious, especially anyone who appears to fall asleep or go into a trance. The Department of Homeland Security is investigating what exactly is causing this, but the CDC is now circulating information that it's likely a form of virus, perhaps some form of worldwide biological attack by extremists. Bullshit. It's Al-Qaeda, Phil mumbled angrily. Ain't no fucking bird flu. He scraped the last bit of egg off his plate and down the last mouthful of his black coffee. I don't know, Phil. It's on all the stations. I think this could be real serious. She finally tore her eyes off the television set and looked at him worriedly. Her hazel eyes could say more in one glance than an hour of her talking. Phil paused the rant he was about to give and swallowed it. He'd be a good husband and worry along with her. Phil put his dishes in the sink and gathered his wife of thirty-five years up in a bear hug. "'Well, you just stay here in the house all day like normal, and I'll go to the shop and have a normal day there, and tonight we'll start a fire in the fireplace, and that'll be the end of it, okay?' He kissed her warmly on the forehead. Her body relaxed a bit against his, pushing his pot belly in a little. "'Okay, baby.' She smiled up at him, and they kissed each other goodbye. Phil and Marcy's house was about three-quarters of a mile down the same street that Phil's place of work was. This meant he didn't drive to work ever, and it meant he got to fire up one of his cigarettes without driving her up a wall. She'd quit years ago when they found out they were going to be grandparents. It was a warm morning, a good June day. Phil didn't feel like it was going to get too hot either, which was always nice. Warm, but not hot and humid. To hell with humidity, Phil always said. More sporting goods was the only real gun shop in town. Of course, three towns over there was a Walmart and a couple sporting goods stores, but Moore's was small-town owned and small-town operated, and you couldn't beat that. In fact, Moore's was opened by the chief of police twenty years ago, and his son was chief of police right now, too. Two generations of locals proud to serve the hunting and outdoors needs of its residents. Moore's was still locked up when Phil got there, but he let himself in with the key. He was fifteen minutes early, as he always was, 
and beat everyone there. He trudged himself inside, turned off the security alarm before it called the cops, as he always did, and started getting the shop ready. Soon as Phil had the window shades up and the register turned on, the rest of his work buddies rolled in. Mr. Moore himself was next, dressed just the same as Phil, though he came with his forty-five on his hip in a holster. No one would ever rob his store, at least not without killing him first. Phil didn't strap his piece on until he got there, which he presently did. Bobby, Mike, and Ben all rolled in right after that. No matter how much Mr. Moore yelled at them, they just couldn't seem to beat him there in the morning. Phil always suspected that Mr. Moore would just wake up five minutes earlier anyway if they did, just to make sure he had something to yell at them about. Part of Mr. Moore's charm, Phil always thought. "'Gentlemen, gather round," Mr. Moore said as all his men poured themselves cups of coffee Phil had brewed earlier. They stopped bullshitting and quieted down. "'If you all have seen the news, there's some weird shit happening out there today. I suspect this might be like 9-11 again, so we need to be ready.' "'Phil, how's inventory looking? We got a lot of spare firearms in stock? And what about ammunition?' Mr. Moore was all business, serious as a rattlesnake. Phil thought about it for a few seconds before replying. "'Well, we got normal shelf stock, plus we got that extra order of Ruger or Mossberg stuff in the gun vaults in the back. No extra pistols, really. Ammunition is normal. Next week we get the first batches of the hunting season supply coming in, though.' Mm. "'Well, if it's at all like 9-11, we'll be sold out of shotguns and rifles by dinner time. Don't forget to run background checks, and make sure that anyone who buys a pistol along with another gun doesn't walk out with the damn thing. Waiting period, remember, guys?' Mr. Moore stared intently at Mike, who had sold two pistols to customers over the past year, and let them walk out with them the same day. A really big no-no. Mr. Moore had managed to hide the incidents, and they'd gotten lucky— but he couldn't risk losing his gun license. Mike kept his eyes rooted firmly on the floor while Mr. Moore made his point. All right, boys, let's have a good day. Bobby and Mike, why don't you get all the new guns in the vault prepped up and get some extra gun cleaning kits and supplies out there on display? Let's try to move all those goddamn boots I ordered by accident last month, too. Thanks, man. Mr. Moore nodded and headed back to his office. The guys all exchanged looks with Mike, who finally looked up. They all laughed briefly, sharing in Mike's shame, after that, they patted him on the back and went to work. Mr. Moore called the day almost perfectly. No sooner than when the men left from their little meeting, customers began coming in. It was always the same kind of people who came in on days like this. Phil had seen it happen countless times over his sixteen years. People tend to get nervous when bad things happen. They think that whatever bad thing has happened, or is happening, is going to happen to them, too. As Americans, purchasing a firearm is a constitutionally approved way to alleviate anxiety, so that's what some people do. It's always the indoors folks that do it, though. The hunters don't. They don't have to. They already own guns. The veterans are the same. They either own a gun already or don't freak out when bad things happen. The customers that come in on days like this are the people who've never shot a gun before. Bankers, IT nerds, psychologists, moms afraid for their kids. You know the type the pocket protector posse. They're the people who make a rush decision that having a gun is now necessary because the world has changed so much overnight. Phil thought these people were idiots, but if they had cash or a credit card, he'd sell them bazookas if he had them in stock. Normally, Phil and Mike ran the gun counter, but Mike was currently banished with Bobby in the back room. That left Ben to help Phil, and he wasn't ready for the constant stream of customers. By noon, Phil pulled Mike back to the counter, and by one, Mr. Moore was up front as well. They had Bobby stand at the door holding an empty shotgun to make sure none of the panicked customers did anything stupid. By 2 p.m., though, Mr. Moore had had enough of the crowd and called his son to send a patrol car over. Phil was up to his neck in uneducated gun buyers for so long he forgot to eat lunch. He'd dealt with assholes who didn't know about the weight for pistols, and he dealt with the assholes who wanted the biggest hand cannon magnums money could buy. He'd dealt with the moms holding their babies and toddlers while they tested the feel on a thirty-eight special. He'd also watched as one baby threw up on an $800 Benelli shotgun. Italian walnut, goddammit. All fucked up. He was hungry, sweaty, and frankly getting a little scared as things got busier and busier. The crowd did get a little more courteous after the officer showed, though, and when Bobby came back inside to help, Phil got a break to eat the frozen dinner he had in the fridge. 
Of course, he took it out to the counter to eat it, and fortunately they had a little break in the flow of customers at the same time. The four men all took a seat wherever they could find one, and hung their heads in exhaustion. So much state paperwork filled out, guns handed over, and ammunition boxes sold, and, believe it or not, Mike had managed to sell four pair of boots to one worried housewife that was afraid her family's footwear wouldn't survive this outbreak of the bird flu. The cop came inside at about the same time, and Phil noticed it was Officer McGreevy, the town's largest cop. McGreevy nodded to Mr. Moore and gave a little wave and a nod to the others. "'Danny, what's all this bullshit? Is this shit for real?' Mr. Moore asked him as he took a bite out of a Danish. "'Well, sir, I can assure you this is no hoax.' McGreevy rested his thumbs in his belt and kicked absently at the dirt on the floor. The men exchanged amused glances. "'Elaborate, son.' Mr. Moore chewed his Danish. McGreevy was icy in his delivery. "'Well, we got the call from the state police early, early this morning, that this was legit. We even heard from the FBI and got a few calls from the state health department, too.' Apparently, state police have blockades on all the interstates and routes coming in. They're stopping and turning around everyone that's sick, especially those folks that are bitten or scratched. I guess a few of the blockades have seen some pretty bad shit, too. A few cars ramming through the cruisers, a couple of officer-involved shootings. Shit's terrible, Mr. Moore. Ain't no joke. The men all had to remember to breathe after hearing that. Murmuring of all forms of curses were uttered, and the quiet was only disturbed by the cop's radio going off. McGreevy, come in. This is Chief Moore. McGreevy reached up and thumbed his radio transceiver on his collar. Go for McGreevy. Hey, is my father there? Can you go to him? The chief said over the walkie. I'm in his presence, chief. Anything you say, him and his guys will hear. A few more customers came in just then, and Mike and Ben got up to take care of them. Mr. Moore moved closer to the officer to hear his son. Dad, I just got the call from the FBI and the ATF that we have the local authority to suspend firearm background checks. What do you think of that? The chief's voice was filled with doubt. Phil could hear it straight through the walkie. Mr. Moore scratched his balding head and furrowed his brow. Shit, son, I don't know. Is this all that bad? We need to put that many guns out on the street today? Dad, the FBI just called and said that some of the larger hospitals in major metro areas are now quarantine zones. I guess Los Angeles is under martial law already. Apparently, down south in Mexico City, the military is doing purges of the ghettos it's so bad. I guess there are thousands of these sickos attacking randomly all over the world. Mr. Moore exhaled and rubbed his face. The customers who just entered had stopped asking about guns and were listening intently to the conversation. The men, Mr. Moore included, sat quietly for a bit. Son, we're the only shop in town. We can be judges of character. If we think someone can buy a gun without the check, then we'll let them. If we think they're shady, then they go through the process as normal. Sound good? The radio was silent for a few seconds, then it squawked. That'd be great, Dad. Be safe there, you guys. But Grievy, if you see anyone that's bit, you put bracelets on them immediately, you understand? State police have authorized that if an officer sees a wounded person and they don't respond to immediate verbal commands, we're to put them down. Understand? McGreevy looked at the people around him, suddenly even more somber and serious than before. Absently, he scratched his smooth scalp. The officer thumbed his radio once more. Roger that, chief. Put him down if uncooperative. Uncooperative and hurt. They have to be visibly hurt, otherwise follow normal protocol. Roger that. That was at 2 p.m., Mr. Moore had Bobby write up some signs telling folks they could only buy a few guns, and Bobby used his faintly superior magic marker skills to make a few signs to put up. At 3 p.m., the store picked up dramatically again. Apparently, the two or three large businesses in town had dismissed their entire workforces to go home and make preparations for whatever the night would bring. From Phil's perspective, it seemed like every person in town was coming in there to give him a hard time and to try and buy a gun after that. At just shy of 4 p.m., Mr. Moore told his men to let the folks start taking pistols home with them if they bought them. Further, Mr. Moore said that if the people who had pistols on hold from earlier in the day didn't come and get them by 5, to put those guns back on the shelf to sell again. He said he had a bad feeling about this. Mike brought out a radio and turned it on so they could listen to the reports coming in. News from all over kept getting worse and worse. Occasionally, Officer McGreevy would poke his head inside and tell the men about another shootout somewhere in the state. There were lots of gun stores being robbed, grocery store fights, and car accidents. People apparently forgot how to drive and act like humans in the span of six hours. 
Terrible world we live in, Phil thought to himself. At about 4 p.m., things started to slow again. The mob at the counter was only two or three people deep by then, and finally it slowed to a trickle. Phil noticed this one character when he came in immediately, but was surprised after he kept his eyes on him. He was a tall dude, little over six feet, hooded sweatshirt and jeans, and had a strong look about him, like he'd take no shit from anyone today. Phil was sure he'd be the one to rob them, but he just stayed in line, kept his eyes peeled on the floor and everyone around him, and was a model citizen. Phil wasn't sure quite what to make of him when he motioned for him to come up to the counter. "'What flavor of destruction can I get for you today, sir?' Phil asked, trying to stay somewhat positive. "'Well, I need one rifle, one shotgun, and one pistol, if possible,' the big man said politely to Phil. Phil nodded. "'What would you like, young man?' "'Well, if you still have any, I'd like a Glock handgun, preferably one of the 9 millimeters with a 17-round mag, or one of the forty cal models. I'd also like, uh—' He looked at the racks behind Phil, searching for what he wanted. A 12- or 16-gauge pump or semi-auto, and a 22 caliber rifle, preferably one that uses a clip, if possible. Phil nodded knowingly. He immediately started liking the big fella. He knew enough about weapons that he knew what he was asking for, and he seemed confident in doing it, and just struck Phil as someone who'd also use them appropriately. Phil nodded, sent out an out, and went to gather the man's order. Phil checked for the Glock, but they were out. Instead, he grabbed a few of the Sig Sauer pistols, which were top-grade firearms, to show the guy. Phil came back and told him the bad news. "'Son, we're flat out of the Glocks, all models. Those went pretty early, I think. We do have some Sigs left over, one nine-millimeter and one forty cal. Either of those work for you?' The younger man nodded. "'Yeah, the nine-millimeter's fine. Terrific. I'll grab the rest of what you need. You care what models or anything?' Phil asked him. "'Use your best judgment. I trust you guys.' Phil smiled at him and went to get the rest of what he asked for. He grabbed the Mossberg Tactical twenty two caliber, which was a clone of the M-16 and M-4 rifles the Army used, and a shotgun he felt the guy would like, another Mossberg, the Model 535 ATS. Both were high quality and would be put to good use by the guy. Phil was confident. When he returned to the counter with the man's order, he'd piled up some supplies to go along with his guns. "'Ammunition? How much you think you'll be needin?' Phil asked as he laid the guns down on the counter. Um, all of it? The guy joked. Phil and he shared a little laugh. Tell you what, son, I think I can spare you four boxes of the twenty-two cal, uh, ten boxes of the nine, and four boxes of the shotgun shells. Will that work? Phil started getting the boxes out from under the counter before the other man answered. It'll have to do, I guess. If I need more than that, I guess we're in a lot more trouble than we realize. He smiled and looked warily out the door. Phil could tell the man's head was screwed on straight. He watched the exits, kept his hands free, had his knees bent just slightly so he wasn't flat-footed, clearly someone with some time served in the military. "'Young man, I'm going to give you the hook up here. I've got some spare magazines for the rifle and the pistol, if you're interested. Two each.' Phil waited for his response before taking those out from under the counter. The big man's eyes lit up like it was Christmas morning. "'Hell yes, I'll take them.' Phil nodded again and grabbed the clips. "'That's everything?' "'Yeah, I, I think so, for now at least.' The man pulled his wallet out and took a credit card from inside and got it ready to hand to Phil. As Phil wrote up the receipt for everything, he looked at the state and federal paperwork normally required for all the weapons. He shook his head to himself and decided it wasn't needed for this sale. So, what's the news? Has it gotten worse or better? The big man leaned on the glass counter and asked. Well, Phil took the credit card and swiped it. McGreevy out there keeps giving us updates. Guess it's pretty bad out there, but it sounds like the Stadies are doing a good job of keeping it under control. He just said a few minutes ago that the only people attacking other people are from out of state so far. People who've been bitten or something. Seems like it's only spreading slowly up in this neck of the woods. Might get lucky with all this. Phil handed the man his card back. He noticed the name was Adrian M. Ring on the card. The receipt printed shortly after, and the man signed it for Phil. Well, Mr. Ring, you use these carefully and be safe. "'Have a great day,' Phil said to the guy. "'Thanks, Phil. I appreciate it. Your name tag is crooked, by the way.' He pointed and smiled at the name tag Phil had long since stopped giving a shit about. Phil huffed a little laugh and dismissed it. They exchanged one last nod, and the man gathered his stuff and left. The store finally had a lull right then. 
Gratefully, Phil sat down on the stool behind the counter and took stock of the store's heavily depleted inventory. They had less than a dozen shotguns and rifles left for sale, and only perhaps a dozen pistols left. Most of those were the pea-shooter variety, though. Derringers, used mostly for show or target pistols. Phil chuckled quietly, thinking about how they'd probably be closing up shop today due to there being nothing left to sell to anyone. Phil rested his eyes for a minute and opened them again when he heard a car screech into the parking lot. It pulled up so close and so fast to McGreevy's cruiser that it damn near hit him. He could see through the door that the car had out-of-state plates. McGreevy barked out a few commands to the driver and backed away. The driver got himself out of the car and started towards the entrance of the store. McGreevy moved himself between the man and the door and drew his service weapon. Phil moved to the end of the counter near the door and put his hand on the revolver he kept holstered on his hip. Bob and Mike were also behind the counter, but sped around it towards the door to get a better look at what was happening outside. Phil could see clearly that sitting in the passenger side of the car there was a young kid, maybe twelve or thirteen years old. He was absolutely mortified at what was happening. Phil knew it was the driver's son immediately. McGreevy leveled his weapon at the chest of the driver and yelled for him to freeze again. The driver was sliding along the front fender of the car, leaning heavily like he was drunk. He slid one hand along the hood absently as he moved, like his arm was dead weight. That was when Phil noticed the crimson stain spreading out from the man's forearm. His bluish-white shirt sleeve had a menacing red stain on it. Phil couldn't see well enough at his age to see if the man was frothing at the mouth or if he was clearly out of control, but McGreevy could. The officer's service weapon barked angrily a few times, and the driver immediately went flat on his face like a sack of mail. Mike and Bob grabbed their guns and bolted out the door. Phil just stood there behind the counter. He'd seen this before back in Vietnam, and had seen enough already. He didn't need to see any more dead bodies. A screeching of brakes down the street echoed shortly after the gunshot. Another car, this one a gray import sedan, sped in reverse, returning to the Moore's parking lot. Phil could see through the window enough that he made out that it was Adrian, the man who just left. Apparently he was returning to see what had happened. The muffled screams of the adolescent boy in the car were starting to get louder when Mike and Bob started hooting and hollering. McGreevy took a few steps closer to the fallen body of the out-of-state driver and put one more round into the back of his head. Phil could see Adrian and the officer exchange glances before he drove off. That was the last time he saw that Adrian guy. McGreevy called in the ambulance immediately and notified the chief. The rest of the Moore staff helped McGreevy with the kid. He was hysterical, and they got him as far away from the scene as they could, which turned out to be Mr. Moore's office. Luckily, Mr. Moore had a talent for dealing with kids, and especially the hysterical ones. It didn't hurt that he had another Danish in his desk, either. Just minutes later, the ambulance pulled into the parking lot with the chief's cruiser in tow. It took almost an hour to get everything figured out. It took another five minutes for everything to go to hell after that. The young boy, whose name turned out to be David, had just arrived in town from out of state where he and his family lived. As he told it, in slight hysterics, his eight-year-old younger brother had gotten rushed to the hospital in his hometown during lunch at school. Apparently he'd been choking on something, and they were unable to clear his airway in time. He suffered some sort of brain damage, and, as David put it, he'd become a veggie burger. David's mother and father made the decision just hours ago to pull the plug on their son and donate his organs to other needy sick children. So, with doctor supervision, they removed David's little brother from life support, and shortly thereafter, his little heart stopped beating. David said he wasn't sure what exactly happened then, but his mother and father were crying a lot and were holding his little brother when something bad happened. His mother was hurt, bitten badly by his little brother in the neck. McGreevy, the chief, and the paramedics surmised it was an arterial spray, probably caused by a bite to the neck. She bled out all over the hospital room and died within seconds, while trying to save his wife, David's father, was bitten in the arm by his dead son, too. David said that his father backhanded the little boy as hard as he could, and the two of them left the room, slamming the door behind them. Phil cringed as the details were spilled out by the young boy. He was far too young to have witnessed such horror. David described through tears that the hospital had become a nightmare. Staff was leaving because it was too dangerous. Some patients were dying from whatever conditions that brought them there, and more and more ambulances kept showing up with hurt and dying people from all over. The little boy said that within minutes of his brother dying, 
There were dozens of the sick attacking more and more of the living. He said his grandparents lived here in town, and his father got them out of the hospital, fighting off more than ten of the rampaging monsters that seemed to multiply faster than possible. The father and son got to their car and escaped north on side roads to here. David said about thirty minutes into the drive his father started to not feel well. His bite wouldn't stop bleeding, no matter how much pressure David put on it in the car. He also said his father started to get sleepy and was sweating like he was running a marathon. They stopped here so they could get a gun and a first aid kit. His father was scared of the hospitals now. Everyone in the office was floored by the story the child shared. The silence was awkward and palpable. No one knew what to say to each other, let alone to the child. David yawned, though, and took off the baseball jacket he was wearing, and a paramedic broke the silence. David? What's that blood on your shoulder? The young female paramedic asked as she pointed to the kid's collar. He had a small, dark brown stain right in the middle of the shoulder and the neck. Oh, it's nothing. When we were escaping, I got bit by one of the nurses that got sick. I'm fine, though. David yawned again and wiped his brow, which was now covered in a thin film of sweat. Everyone else in the room shifted back away from the kid. The chief moved his body slightly, putting it between the kid and the entrance to the hall. What? David tried to ask what was wrong, but the word half fell out of his mouth, and he collapsed face first out of the chair, straight to the floor. The two paramedics yelled for space, and the Moore's employees quickly exited the room as they got to work. The two police officers stayed inside, gathering equipment and handing it off to the paramedics. All of the other men gathered in the hall just outside the room, trying to watch what was happening. The two paramedics worked feverishly to figure out what was happening to the little boy. They checked his vitals and tore his shirt off to get a better look at the bite on his shoulder. Once the wound was exposed, everyone gasped. The bite mark was very deep and was surrounded by an angry red halo of infection. The flesh was swollen and was turning a slight shade of grayish-blue right at the edge of the teeth marks. A very unhealthy wound indeed. Within a minute, the two emergency technicians were performing CPR on the limp boy. They pumped his chest vigorously while squeezing an air bulb connected to a plastic mask on his face, trying to get life back into his tortured little body. The boy's arms and legs jumped with every powerful chest compression. They struggled for nearly ten minutes before they slumped to the floor next to his dead body, defeated. The male paramedic's eyes welled with tears, and soon after everyone was rubbing their eyes, and all were in shock from what had just happened. The chief excused himself out of the room, unable to contain his emotions. Not twenty minutes ago this young boy was talking, had emotions, and was alive and well. Now he was on the floor, dead, his life gone. The whole group of people assembled was in shock. No one spoke at all, at least not until David started to twitch. Both paramedics jumped into action and wiped their eyes clear of tears. Phil's heart leapt out of his mouth as he felt a sudden burst of hope. All he could think of was his two grandkids out there somewhere, and about how he hoped nothing like this would ever happen to them. The two paramedics started to take David's vitals and get an oxygen feed on his nose. His little frame went from twitching to still again in seconds. The two paramedics hovered over his chest, confused. Then his eyes snapped open, and all hell broke loose. David's dead eyes focused on the woman EMT right above his head, and he snapped up at her, biting the underside of her arm viciously. A gout of blood sprayed all over David and the floor of the office as she leapt away, clutching her arm. As soon as that happened, the other paramedic grabbed David by the shoulder and pinned him to the floor, but his wrist was too close to the kid's face, and David turned his head and chomped down on him. His little teeth dug into the wrist until blood flowed freely, and the medic had to yank away. This turned out to be a terrible mistake, though, as when he yanked away David's teeth stayed firm, and a giant chunk of the wrist came free from his arm, severing tendons and veins. He fell onto his back, holding his bleeding arm, blood vessels exposed, screaming, and started to go into shock. The Moore's employees were flat-out dumbfounded. Their entire world had been turned on its head in mere minutes. As they stood slack-jawed, the little teenager sat himself up and crawled across the office floor to the frozen medic with the bleeding wrist. With no compassion, no malice, and no emotion whatsoever, he bit the arm again, ripping another chunk out. It was as if he were a machine, slowly, silently consuming the meat in front of him. 
The paramedic tipped over, slipping even further into shock as he was eaten alive, one child-sized bite at a time. The lady bitten in the arm, who had tried to resuscitate David, shoved her way past the Moorsmen, screaming for them to get out of her way. She took off at full speed down the hall and out into the store. They could vaguely hear the bells ringing on the door as she left. Eventually, the shock of what was happening was shattered when a gun went off. Phil had quietly drawn his revolver and shot David in the side. His little frame was tossed violently against the corner of Mr. Moore's desk from the impact of the heavy slug. His back snapped in two as he was bent around the edge of the desk. He crumpled in a heap on the floor. "'Jesus, Phil! It was a fucking kid!' Mike screamed. Mr. Moore yelled back in Phil's defense. "'Shut the fuck up, Mike. That kid was sick, and he would have eaten you just as soon as he was done with that guy in there.' Mike shook his head in disbelief. "'Sir, you know I love you, but I am the fuck out of here. I gotta get my parents and my girlfriend and my dog and head up to our hunting cabin. This shit ain't funny any more.' Bobby said, looking desperate. Mr. Moore nodded, and Bobby was gone out the front immediately. He passed the chief, who had run back inside, gun drawn. Mr. Moore walked slowly into his office and knelt over the prone form of the paramedic. He checked his neck for a pulse, but shook his head. There was no pulse to be found, and now they had a dead paramedic to add to their growing list of casualties. Mr. Moore looked up to his son, the chief, and shook his head in total disbelief. You could read the expression as plain as day. This can't be happening. Suddenly, Mr. Moore's face twisted in pain, and he let out a yelp and grabbed his ankle. From behind him, the corpse of little David had taken a bite out of his Achilles tendon. Mr. Moore tilted forward and fell on his side, scrambling as best he could to get away from the wrecked body of the boy. The chief stepped into the room, and he and McGreevy began firing at the child. The racket was deafening in the hall. Officer and chief emptied their weapons into the little boy, sending his body flipping back and forth all the way into the corner of the office until it came to rest propped up at an odd angle against a file cabinet. Phil's ears were ringing loudly as the two men ended their barrage on the boy. Mike started to mumble quietly, shaking his head. All he could manage over and over was, No! 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 Eventually he turned and walked out of the store. Ben looked around the room and, without waiting for any acknowledgment, walked out following Mike. Mr. Moore, in the meantime, had started to let slip a string of profanities that would make a drunken sailor blush. The chief and Officer McGreevy went to his aid as Phil just tried to regain his hearing. He holstered his revolver and rubbed his temples in a vain attempt to repair his beaten eardrums. "'Dad, are you okay?' Chief Moore knelt beside his elderly father, checking his leg. McGreevy thumbed his walkie again and started to send out the call for additional medical personnel. No one was answering. "'What the hell is happening?' Mr. Moore said through clenched teeth. He exhaled powerfully, frustrated and in pain. "'I don't know, Dad, but we're having more ambulances come, and they'll take you to the hospital. We'll get this sorted out.' The chief was starting to panic. His voice was cracking. "'Nope. Doesn't work that way, does it, son?' Mr. Moore shook his head, wincing in pain. "'Those bites are all it takes. Look at what happened here, right here, right now. That boy was bitten, and now he's bitten me, and that man there.' He poked a finger over at the slumped form of the dead paramedic. "'He'll be trying to eat you before we know it, and then I will, too.' The chief's eyes were spilling tears down his cheeks. "'That's bullshit, Dad. Nonsense. Help is coming.' He shook his head defiantly against his dad. "'Only help I'm getting now is a bullet to my temple.' Who's doing it for me? Mr. Moore winced again in pain and made a conscious effort to make eye contact with the three other men remaining in the room. McGreevy shook his head in a clear no, stood up and walked out of the room. He wanted no part of this. The chief was sobbing now. He buried his face in his father's chest and hugged him awkwardly. Looking over his son's shoulder, he locked gazes with Phil. Phil knew what had to happen. Mr. Moore nodded ever so slightly and hugged his son back for the last time. After a moment or two, Mr. Moore said, "'All right, tell your mother I love her, and you take care of her now. You get your ass home and take care of Stacy and your boy. Hell with the town now, you take care of them.' Mr. Moore's voice cracked at the end. He saw the writing on the wall, felt his clock ticking down. All the chief could choke out was a meek, "'Okay.' He stood up and walked out of the office, pausing only to put a hand reassuringly on Phil's shoulder. 
They looked at each other briefly, and then the chief walked past him and out. Phil could hear him starting to sob again as he passed the counter and exited the shop. The two long-time friends just sat still where they were. Neither man looked at each other while they separately contemplated the situation. From the side of the office where the paramedic's body was came a scratching noise. Both men looked over in unison and saw that he was twitching. "'Shit, that's fast,' Mr. Morse said in a disinterested monotone. "'Hey, up, Phil muttered, eyes intently on the convulsing medic. After a few seconds, the twitching stopped, and his eyes popped open, fixated on the fallen gun store owner. The undead medic began the slow crawl across the office to get at his prey. He was stopped short. Without missing a beat, Phil drew his revolver again and put a three fifty seven round straight into his ear. His head blew wide open and painted the side of the desk a thousand shades of red and pink. Chunks of brain slid slowly down, mixed in with streaks of blood and clear cranial fluid. Mr. Moore watched with no emotion and nodded his approval. Nice shot. Thanks, boss. Okay, then. Yep. Yeah. Anything you need me to do? Mr. Moore squirreled his face up in thought. He thought long and hard about it, but eventually shook his head no. Okay, I'm going to grab some stuff here and head back to Marcy if that's okay. Phil hadn't moved an inch since he shot the paramedic. Phil, buddy, you're going to blow my head off in a minute. You don't have to ask me for any permission to do shit, Mr. Moore smiled. I know, boss. I guess I'll see you soon. Phil's lips trembled as he steeled himself for what he was about to do. Not too soon, brother. You take care now. Mr. Moore closed his eyes. Phil raised the revolver and aimed at his longtime friend. He kept it there for too long, though, and had to lower it. Finally, he choked down a sob and raised it again. It was the loudest gunshot Phil had ever heard. After he gathered himself and stopped crying, Phil went back out into the store. He grabbed two of the remaining pistols, several boxes of ammunition, and threw on a hunting vest. He peeked outside to find the ambulance still parked in the lot, but the chief's cruiser and McGreevy's cruiser both long gone. For the first time all day, the parking lot was essentially empty. Since the ambulance arrived, no customers had come, so the store was empty. Phil turned off the coffee pot, locked all the gun safes, then unlocked all the gun safes, and walked out. He decided that if anyone needed a gun now, it was better to leave the safes unlocked. Not like he needed any more weapons, really. He still had a few more at the house if it came to it. Out of habit, the aging gun store clerk almost set the alarm on the door, but caught himself. Not much sense in doing that, either, he thought. It had gotten pretty warm outside, and the sun was beating down pretty good on his walk home. He kept a good eye out as he walked the vacant sidewalk back. He didn't want to get jumped by anyone, especially after surviving what just happened at Moore's. His whole walk home, he tried to think of ways to tell his wife that the nightmare was here already. He tried to think of a way to tell his wife how he'd just blown his best friend's head clean off and shot a paramedic, too. He was never clever with words, though, and by the time he got home, he still didn't have any idea what to say to her. As he walked up the steps to his front door, he noticed a few dark brown splotches on the concrete. Blood. Phil's back yelled out in protest as he bent down to touch it. Gooey. Almost dry. He started to worry. The old man with the perpetually disheveled hair led himself into the front door and drew his handgun again. The door stopped short of opening fully, though, and he stumbled a bit, bumping his head on the door. He took a step back and realized the door had hit a human foot. Laying in a heap in the hallway was the body of the female paramedic that David had bitten earlier. Her body here explained why the ambulance was still there in Moore's parking lot. Heading off in a trail towards the kitchen was a series of blood splatters. Long streaks of blood were on the wall. Phil's nose caught a whiff of an unfamiliar smell in his house. Cigarettes. He holstered the revolver and walked into the kitchen. Sitting in the same spot he had occupied for breakfast earlier that morning was Marcy. Her back was to him, but he could see an ashtray on the table in front of her. Her left hand held a cigarette, and she absently flicked the ash into the tray. She was fixated on the television set which was blaring out the emergency warning. Phil's mind couldn't focus on that. He was too intently tracking the blood splatters that led straight to the floor beside his wife, his beloved Marcy. Marcy, baby, what's happened? Phil asked quietly. 
Immediately his wife leapt out of her seat, stomping the cigarette out of the tray, caught red-handed. No, nothing, Phil, nothing at all. When she turned, Phil could see she had a large bandage on her other arm. It was dark red with blood seeping through it. A trickle was running down to the wrist as she faced him. Phil looked over his shoulder at the body of the paramedic, then back to his wife's arm. He looked up at her eyes, the same eyes that could always say more than a thousand words could. They said everything he needed to know. Phil closed his eyes for a second, then opened them and sat down in the chair that Marcy usually sat in at the table. He fished his pack of cigarettes out of his pocket and fired one up with the lighter Marcy had on the table. He motioned for Marcy to join him. She giggled a little and sat down next to him. Phil picked the butt up she'd just put out on the tray and gave it back to her. She put it to her mouth and he lit it for her. She took a long drag. "'Thought you quit these?' Phil asked with a cigarette in his mouth. "'Seemed like a good time to start again.' She raised her arm and showed him the bloody wrapping on her forearm. Phil looked long and hard at it. He knew it was a bite. Her eyes were still talking to him. "'Well, how was work?' She inhaled deeply, enjoying the sensation she'd deprived herself of years ago. "'Busy?' Phil blew a smoke ring out, sending it across the room. "'That's good.' She exhaled her smoke out and watched it drift up to the ceiling. Phil took the revolver out of the holster on his hip and clicked the cylinder out. Still had enough shots to do it. He clicked the cylinder shut and set it down on the table next to the ashtray, right in between he and Marcy. She took another drag and looked at the silver gun on the table, with its long barrel full of grace, strength, and violence. Phil, I love you. She looked at him again with those eyes those bright, hazel eyes. Phil noticed her brow was starting to bead with sweat. Marcy, I will always love you. His voice broke, and he sucked in a deep breath. Tears were streaming down both their cheeks now. Phil hefted the revolver up and looked at it, contemplated it. He did it as fast as he could before his brain could tell him not to do it. As it turned out, that was the loudest gunshot he'd ever heard. Phil sobbed at his kitchen table until he finished his cigarette. Once he put it out, he got down on the linoleum floor next to his wife, Marcy, and kissed what was left of her face. He cried a little more and put the muzzle of the gun under his chin. Phil never heard how loud the gunshot was that took his own life. October 31st Happy Halloween, Mr. Journal. It's weird. I'm sitting here in the afternoon of October 31st, also known as Halloween, and there isn't a single iota of me that wishes things were normal today. Is it wrong of me to think that way? I guess the little kid inside of me is kind of stoked that there isn't anyone around to tell me what to do. I don't have to go to work tonight, I don't have any bills to pay anymore, and I can eat more or less whatever I want whenever I want. Of course, if I eat whatever I want whenever I want, I will run out of food very quickly— it's like a one-person adult Lord of the Flies here. That's not entirely true. I love kids, and I love giving out candy on Halloween to see the kids in their cool costumes. I can remember this one kid a few years ago that came to our door dressed in a green dragon costume. He had this plastic cybernetic arm on one hand as well, and after he said trick-or-treat, he presented his cybernetic arm to me proudly and belched out, I am a robot dragon priceless. That kid, I miss. I never saw him again, to my knowledge, but I hope that kid's okay, for the sake of all future robot dragons. Tonight, I miss Cassie. She always liked dressing up on Slutoween, and I miss the trampy outfits. They led to good sex. I don't think I miss the sex yet, though. Just being with her. As long as I don't reminisce, I'm okay. When I start to think about things that we did together, or things that happened between the two of us, I get emotional. Got to keep off that subject as much as I can to try and stay together. So, it's Halloween, and I sit here at the dorm kitchen table, gas generator humming in the basement, laptop plugged in, all alone save for Otis my cat, a world filled with flesh-eating zombies and starving survivors of the apocalypse. Granted, things could be better, but I'm not starving. I'm warm, and I'm holed up in a pretty safe place, I think. Enhance the positives, someone once told me. Daily update portion of the diary. 
Weather is cool, seasonably so, but not cold. It's been damp and drizzly since my last entry. Incidentally, I have come to fucking hate fog. I mentioned that I do two checks on the campus every day to check for stragglers or zombies. Fog makes that patrol amazingly difficult. Vision is almost totally hampered, and I can't hear shit through the fog. It really scares me about snowstorms in winter later on. Anyone who's been outside while it's snowing knows the dead silence caused by the falling snow, and I can't imagine it'll make my life any fucking easier. Fuck Mother Nature. Fuck her in her soggy, stupid ass. Luckily, I haven't encountered anything in the past few foggy days. Well, to be more technically accurate, I haven't noticed that I've encountered anything. For all I know, I walked right by a horde of the undead bastards every time I stepped outside and just don't know it. Whatever, I guess. From the inside of Hall E here, everything is quiet, and I feel pretty safe tonight. Safe enough to eat one of my candy bars. Safe enough to ride at length about my first night here on campus. I like to call that night Night of the Living Dead Private School Students. You'll see why. So, I arrived on campus to a disorganized mess. Amy, one of the admissions chicks, had filled me in on the day's events on campus, which were all bad. They had lockdown classrooms, paranoid and or crazy parents, car accidents, one seizure, staff running away screaming, one diabetic reaction, a few assaults, etc., etc. Not a safe place to be, and it was where I had chosen to make my nest to ride this thing out. You could say with relative safety that I had some doubt at that moment. I mean, I could walk right then and there, just fucking get back in my car and go somewhere else. Kick in the door of some rural farmhouse and board that shit up, also known as Plan B. Turtle it up somewhere else. But no, I stuck to my guns. I never walk away from a fight I think I can win, and strangely enough, I think I can win just about every fight. Cassie said my confidence bordered on arrogance. I think it turned her on. So, after checking in with Amy and the eight paranoid parents trying to find their children, I decided to go find the crazy-ass parent that was going to go rescue the kids from Mrs. Goodall's classroom. I thanked Amy and tried to reassure the parents right before I told them to stay in the admissions house. I needed more firepower. I'd grabbed the pistol and the twenty two, but this struck me as a shotgun kind of situation. I went back to the car, switched the rifle for the gauge, and started to head south towards the main classroom building. Just as I headed that way, I heard the distinct sound of gunfire coming from inside the building. Not good, right? I picked up some speed and got to the front of the building. All of our doors are either glass industrial doors or steel fire doors. The school had the glass kind. I looked through, yanked the door open, and headed inside. The halls were lit by the emergency lights that are on at night normally. They're on a timer and kick on automatically at 8 p.m. Two lights are in each major hallway, one at each end, flooding towards the center of the corridor. They aren't the brightest bulbs in the building, but they suitably keep it lit. That's not a joke or a pun about the students or staff or anything. I'm actually talking about the lights there. So, the school building is square and three floors. Classrooms were on each side of the central hallway with some offices in the front and back. The staircase was in the middle of the hall on the left side. I remember feeling very out of place here. Normally, I'm never in the main classroom building. I work, read, worked in the residential program at night, so there's no reason to be in that building. It was weird just being in there, let alone being in there specifically to find a gun-toting lunatic and to liberate eight kids being held captive by a granola-crunching English teacher. Weirdness abounds. A combat cleared the lower floor in four minutes. I did it silently so as not to arouse any suspicion or to let the dude upstairs know I was here. The bottom floor was all clear. You could tell from the clutter in the classrooms that it had been a bad day. The room smelled sweaty. Plus, the kids' book bags were tossed about and there were snack food wrappers all over the place. You could tell they'd been holed up in the rooms for a while earlier. Right as I was getting to the back office for the guidance counselors, I heard some yelling coming from upstairs. It was distant, coming from the third floor. I couldn't afford to move much faster, though. My safety would be at risk. That's a debate you have a lot in situations like that. You weigh your safety with the potential outcomes, and at some point you realize that your safety is not worth any potential outcome. I was willing to go in the building to try and rescue the kids, 
but I wasn't willing to die for them. Not today, at least. I wanted to survive this. I remember tripping slightly going up the stairs, one of those times when your toe catches the lip of a stair. I didn't fall, but I put a hand down to catch myself. I made it to the second floor after that with no problem. The second floor is largely wide open, save for the bookcases in the library. There are some floor-to-ceiling support posts, but otherwise it's bookcases and tables. I swept down the aisles in between the bookcases and quickly made sure the floor was clear of students, staff, and the undead. I made it back to the main staircase and took the steps up to the third floor a little more carefully. I could hear a man yelling, but couldn't make out exactly what was being said. I could also just barely hear someone else talking, but it was really muffled, like they were in a closet or something. I made my way to the top of the stairs and lay down on my belly. I slid my body up the last couple of feet and poked my head into the hall at floor level. People generally don't look for threats at floor level. It's a pretty safe way to check out a situation around a corner. Although, I don't know if this would work on the undead. Caveat emptor. Backlit by one of the emergency floodlights, I can make out a guy, about six feet tall, holding a gun and looking into the small window of the classroom at the end of the hall. Classroom doors are sturdy fire class doors with the small rectangular window with the chicken wire glass in it. Strong doors, for sure. He was banging on the door pretty solidly in between trying to look through the window. I took it in for a bit, then slowly got to my feet and came out into the hallway. Freeze! I barked out like I was a cop. I hoped his reaction would be instant compliance. Luckily, he froze. I think I told him to identify himself, and without turning or moving an inch, he said he was Dan Haggerty. I knew his kid, Dale. Jock. Prick. Womanizer. Prized football talent. Huge sense of entitlement. I was just fucking thrilled to meet the guy that spawned that MTV cast off. He sputtered out a few sentences, and I pieced together that his son was in the room, and that something was wrong with the teacher. That struck a chord. I told him to calm down, that I was staff, and that I was here to help. He turned and looked at me, and even in the shitty light of the emergency lamps, I could see he went pale. Evidently, my appearance was... disturbing. I remember forcing a chuckle to lighten the moment up a bit. He laughed with me after I told him things were messy out there. Even after we sort of had our bonding moment, you could see he was pained. You could also see he had a huge shotgun and a handgun stuck in the waistband of his dockers. I asked him what the problem was. To sum up, Mrs. Goodell had secured her classroom according to safety procedures. To keep the kids occupied all day, she had turned on the television in the classroom and had them watch the news networks to learn about this historic day. Not sure that was a good idea. From what I gathered from Dan, a couple of the kids started to panic, eventually freaked out, and together with a few of the calm students, they had restrained them. That was hours ago. In the meantime, Mrs. Goodell had put some cloth over the small window to obscure the view into the corner classroom. Mrs. Goodell was concerned for the health of the two restrained kids. One was a boy, one a girl. Dan explained that apparently the kids had gone limp in their restraints hours ago, but it started to move again and were struggling against the hobcobbled bonds. That line totally set me off. First they went limp, then woke up and were struggling. Immediately I was sure they had died and were now reanimated. I motioned for Dan to get away and let me try and talk to her. I rapped on the window and yelled into her that it was me and that I was here to help. I could hear some of the kids whimpering through the door and even heard one yell out my name. I had pretty good relationships with a few of the kids in the dorm. I could hear the tension in their voices straight through the door. After maybe a minute, I saw the cloth get pulled back a bit and Mrs. Goodell's face appear. Like I said, she was a bit offbeat. She was about five feet even, a bit chunky, and had a giant poofy afro puff of gray hair. Her black-rimmed glasses looked straight out of the 60s, and she generally dressed like she was headed to Woodstock. Amusing lady to talk to, for sure. Not that night, though. Her eyes were bloodshot, and... She was pasty white from stress. I remember when she appeared, she didn't say anything. She just looked at me silently through the door. I could tell from the look in her eyes that things were bad inside the room. She mouthed and pointed that Dan had to leave for her to talk. So I asked Dan for some privacy. As soon as he was twenty feet away or so, she finally whispered to me, The Haggerty boy was one of the kids who had to be restrained, Adrian. I can remember everything she said word for word. He's dead, Adrian. 
I didn't mean to. The kids didn't mean to, but he was so strong. We had to tie him down extra tight, except now he's not really dead anymore, and we've got him in the closet, but I think he's free now, and we don't know what to do, Adrian. I don't want to lose my job, and I don't want his dad to find out that his son is dead, and uh, I cut her off. Erica, that was her first name. I'm sure everything that has happened was an accident or was absolutely necessary. A lot of people have been hurt today by accidents and things are not good everywhere. We need to stick together right now and these kids need to get to their parents. Can we at least get the kids who are being safe out and down to their parents so they can go home? We'll deal with the two tied up kids afterwards. I said it all as quietly as I could. I didn't want to alert Dan that his kid was one of the two that were restrained and likely dead. Mrs. Goodell swallowed and nodded. Keep him away. I nodded at her and asked for a moment. She waited as I walked down the hall to the armed father. I'll never forget this discussion either. The banality of it in retrospect haunts me. Dan, in order for her to let the kids out, you need to be safe and stay away from the classroom, okay? His response was a little sullen, introspective even. Yeah, yeah, I get it. I suppose if it were my kid in there, I wouldn't want you guys to let them out with a guy with a gun in the hall, right? He sort of laughed, realizing the absurdity of it all. Exactly. Can you hang back here at the stairs for me while we get the kids out? There are still two that need to be calmed down before they can be let out, okay? I remember he nodded emphatically. I walked back to the classroom and nodded to Mrs. Goodell. She turned, addressed the class quickly, letting them know what was up. They absolutely leapt off their desks and chairs to get out. I can't blame them either. They'd been locked up in there since morning. It was now nearly nine. Once they were up and calmed down enough to exit safely, she unlocked the door and they started streaming out. I didn't notice that Dan had made his way right back up behind me. As soon as the first kid was through the door, he shoved me out of the way and pushed past the exiting students and into the classroom. Chaos ensued. The kids all backed away, deeper into the room. They knew who it was. Father and son looked too familiar. One of the girls at the end of the line in the classroom started sobbing and simply pointed at the closet door next to Mrs. Goodell's desk. Most of the kids were paralyzed as I entered the room and started to physically shove the kids out the door. Mrs. Goodell herself put her body in the path of the kids and Mr. Haggerty. Valiant, really. Dan ripped the closet door open and saw his son for the first time that day, and for the last time in his life. Dale was standing, freed from the makeshift bonds that had held him most of the day. My bet is he suffocated or maybe had a heart attack or seizure. Who knows? But he was dead for sure. Really dead. And he was a foot away from his dad. Dan had no chance or ability to defend himself from his son. Dan's breath escaped him. The look of shock and pain on his face was epic. Dale lunged at him and bit him savagely on the shoulder. I remember Dan letting out a low howl in pain as he had a chunk torn from him. Everything else happened so fast. I was almost frozen, watching, and had just stopped pushing kids out. Mrs. Goodell had just gone stone-faced, witnessing the events unfold. Dan backpedaled away from his son, clutching his shoulder, and turned to the rest of us. All he said was, You fucking bitch! He really choked it out through a mess of pain. Must have taken tremendous effort to say it. And then he started shooting. I only saw his first two shots. Shot number one went at his son Dale, hitting him in center mass and throwing him back inside the closet. Shot number two went right at Erica, hitting her flush and hitting a bunch of the kids. Remember, folks, close with a shotgun is usually good enough. As soon as I saw him wheeling towards the kids, I dove away. I don't know exactly what happened next. Well, I don't know what happened while I was unconscious. I've pieced it together a little since that night, but essentially when I dove, I just went on pure instinct. I didn't look where I was going. It would seem that I went head first into a desk and took the corner right to the temple. I don't know how long I was out, but it wasn't that long. Five minutes? Easily the luckiest five minutes of my life. As I came to, I remember just blinking a few times and realizing my head was throbbing like I'd been hit with a jackhammer. I stayed very still as I could hear some movement in the room with me. Scratching, chewing, slurping. 
The floodlights were not giving me a lot of light to see by, so I was a little off kilter. Being blind is no fucking fun. See Hatred for Fog. I rolled over slowly, and my eyes adjusted to the level of light. I could see bodies all over the front of the classroom where the kids had been, and where Erica and Dan had been standing. Some of the bodies were down, clearly down, and a few of them were either sitting up or moving to stand up. I counted four kids, plus the two bodies of the adults. I reached around slowly for the shotgun, but couldn't find it. Plan B was the pistol, which I drew as slowly as I could. I knew I had to get out of the room. Third floor window wasn't a jumping option, and this room didn't have a fire escape. Across the hall was Dr. Potter's classroom, which did have a fire escape. It was also empty, so that was viable. I very slowly sat up and assessed things. This was one of the moments where I really learned and appreciated how quiet these fucking things were. I was in a room that was, for all intents and purposes, filled with the motherfuckers, and I could barely hear anything. Four kids were dead in the room, and getting back up to do the whole undead thing that was all the rage today. Erica was dead, too, nearly blown in half by Dan's shotgun blast. She was starting to sit up presently. Well, as much as someone bisected by a shotgun can, at least. Dan and Dale were nowhere to be found. I could hear struggling coming from the closet, which had to be the second student restrained earlier. I lifted the pistol, drew a bead on the kid closest to me, and shot. She flung sideways on top of another kid. Erica turned towards me immediately, as did the other zombies. I started shooting from the hip as fast as I could squeeze the trigger. I shot until the slide locked back and the gun clicked empty. In retrospect, it was a huge waste of ammunition. I don't even know how many I killed with my spray and prey tactics, but it caused enough commotion and sent their bodies around enough for me to bolt out of the room. I didn't find the shotgun when I jumped up, so I was down to just the pistol. Once in the hall, I found three more kids. They were dead, too. Well, dead-ish. Dale was there as well, finishing a meal of one of his classmates. He found me much more interesting, though, and came at me. Luckily, the hall was pretty wide, and I just sidestepped him and the other two and bolted for the stairway. I fucking flew down those stairs, two or three at a time in giant leaps. I got to the ground floor in maybe twenty seconds. I blasted my way out through the glass doors and reloaded the pistol, which was empty. I had the presence of mind to slip the empty clip into my cargo pocket, too. Go me. By then, the throbbing in my head was starting to fade, which was about the only good thing that had happened to me in some time. I hoofed it back towards my car as fast as I could go. That, too, turned out to be a pretty shitty idea. The couple of kids who had actually made it out of the classroom went there, too, and they were both badly wounded, I guess. They made it to the admissions office and made things much worse. I think they bled out from shotgun wounds. That, or they were bitten by Dale on their way out. Either way, the two kids had died, had come back, and had killed more people here. As I stopped my run towards admissions, I nearly got ran over by one of the parents leaving the campus at top speed. I could hear them screaming in grief as they drove by. I could see several of the zombies feasting in the yard of the admissions house. There was at least half a dozen dead there now, and my car was right there next to them. My other gun was in the car, as well as the extra 9 millimeter ammo. I did a quick check around campus, and in the dim light of the few street lamps we have, I could see more shambling forms headed my way. It was more of the dead from earlier in the day, congregating to the noise. I needed a place to hole up for the night. Shit, at that point, I needed a place to hole up for five minutes to catch my damn breath. At that point, I had no idea where anyone was or where to go. My plan had crashed and fucking burned all in a heartbeat. Fuck Dan Haggerty. I started jogging towards some of the maintenance buildings, away from the bulk of the zombies I saw moving my way. I went into my pocket for my facilities keys, and that's when I realized they were gone. I found them much later in Mrs. Goodell's classroom, but for the moment I was sans keys. Anything else, God? Getting pretty sick of these pop quizzes here, dude. Way to test faith, bro. I remember getting really pissed and actually screaming out, What the fuck? I'll grant you that wasn't a good idea at all, but I was really angry and pissed and was just starting to feel a little helpless. I started jogging again, this time around the back of the maintenance buildings near the water. I didn't see anything of use. I did, however, see a ladder lying on the ground behind the last outbuilding. 
I remember looking and saw the back of the admissions building. Admissions had a steeply sloped roof for the main structure, but an addition they put on two years ago was almost flat-roofed. It took me a minute or two, but I got the ladder free of some shit on it and ran with it to the admissions house. My heart was pounding bad. Zombies aren't smart at all. They can't plan ahead. The ones in the yard not minutes before had followed me all the way around all the maintenance buildings and were now coming up behind me, leaving the yard empty again. I leaned the ladder against admissions and started to run around to my now largely wide-open car, but I saw a bunch of the kids from the schoolhouse coming right at me, ten feet away from my car at most. Scrap that idea. I spun, realized that the zombies following me from around the outbuildings were damn near on top of me, and dashed for the ladder. I climbed like never before. Despite moving like my life actually depended on it, several of my kids actually got close enough to grab my pants legs as I pulled myself up higher. I kicked at them to get them off my ankles. I scrambled to the top, rolled onto the roof, and wrestled the ladder away from the growing throng of zombie children and parents gathering at the base of the admissions house. I think it was half past nine or so by then, maybe even ten, and I was hungry, kind of cold, mildly concussed, surrounded by dozens of quietly hungry zombies, trapped in the dark on a rooftop with fifteen rounds of nine-millimeter ammo, a sword, and no keys to get inside anywhere. And that was just the beginning of the worst night of my life. More later, Adrian. November 2010 November 2nd Mr. Journal, where were we? Oh, yeah, rooftop on the admissions building. Worst night of my fucking life. Yeah, about that. So, let's refresh the page, eh? I'd gone into the classrooms and found Dan Haggerty on the third floor trying to communicate with Mrs. Goodell. Once I got him away a bit, Mrs. Goodell revealed to me that Haggerty's son had died, had become a zombie, and was locked in a supply closet inside the classroom. Once we got everything calm, Goodell opened the door to clear her students out. Haggerty surprised us and burst in trying to find his son. He found him, got bit by him, and retaliated in a totally sensible fashion by blasting his son, Mrs. Goodell, and several of the students with a 12-gauge. I was knocked out cold when I dove for cover. On returning to the land of the awake, and living dead, I discovered I was surrounded by fucking zombies. I lost track of my shotgun, but using my SIG, I'd managed to shoot my way out of the classroom before the zombies killed me. Complete shit luck that they didn't take a nibble while I was passed out. I got the fuck out of the classroom and bolted back across campus to admissions, where I found yet another degenerating situation. Two of the kids wounded in the classroom incident, or perhaps bitten while I was out cold, had made it to the admissions house, promptly died, sat back up, bit their parents and a few staff members, and spread this disease even further. During that scramble, I realized my keys were history. I had a minor mental breakdown, found a ladder, and climbed on top of the admissions building after running for my life for a few minutes. I only made it onto the admissions roof by the slimmest of margins, too. The zombie kids, parents, and staff all clawing at my feet as I climbed the ladder. I'm lucky I didn't lose a sneaker on my way up. So, that's where I realized that maybe, just maybe, I'd made a mistake. Perhaps a minor error in judgment. I distinctly remember flopping down, facing up the stars on that clear June 23rd, that day. I think that's actually the first time I've said the actual day all this shit went down. It's weird that it's taken me this long to actually put a date to that day. That Wednesday, June 23rd. Anyway, it took a minute or two to gather myself and assess my new situation. I had enough space on the roof to lay down comfortably, assuming, of course, you find lying on asphalt shingles comfortable. I had fifteen rounds of my pistol and my sword. My car was locked, and my keys were incognito. I hadn't eaten in hours, and I had no water. Otis, my devoted and handsome cat, was still locked firmly away in his carry-all in my car as well. He hadn't eaten in hours either, and also had no water. I peeked over the edge and did a quick assessment of the walking dead hanging out, and got really depressed. Where I had pulled up the ladder, there were at least two dozen zombies. Couldn't barely hear them, either. Creepy as shit. The only noise you could hear were a few cars running in parking lots nearby, the sound of the water lapping at the shore nearby, and 
a faint scratching at the siding of the house. Ever heard a bunch of people slowly scraping their nails on wood in the dark? Ever hear the same thing, only by undead, just a few feet away, that are aching to eat the meat off your bones? Creepy doesn't even come close to touching it. What to do, right? I was fucked. I couldn't see well enough to really feel comfortable in trying to get off the roof. I couldn't get to the other side of the building either, as the roof was far too sloped to risk trying a crossing. I had zombies on all sides, and little to no options even if I did get off the roof. I decided to wait for daylight. I'd be hungry, but at least then I could see. Many things happened that night. There was still a small number of staff, parents, and students on campus. I saw several of them escape, driving at breakneck speeds over the bridge. I even tried to flag them down, jumping up and down, screaming, waving, but it was all to no avail. I thought at several times I would be able to get off the roof when they left, as some of the zombies started to follow their cars, but they came back too quickly to risk it. I spent long stretches that night just trying to be quiet, observing the zombies. I learned a lot that night watching them, and have put it to good use since then, too. Low light of the cool night up there was when the last car came on campus. It was another parent coming for their child. I don't know what kid or who the parents were, but I remember vividly how they died. Their sedan crossed the bridge cautiously at about midnight, creeping along. I was already starving by then. They crept up to the admissions house, and I remember jumping up and waving at them. They didn't see me. The car came to a stop, and Mom and Dad got out of it and walked carefully up to the door. I didn't want to holler at them, as I felt I'd just gotten the zombies below to forget about me, so I was trying to do a loud whisper, if that makes any sense. They didn't hear me. The dad was older, probably mid-fifties with gray hair, and had an aluminum baseball bat. Mom was much younger, struck me as sort of a trophy wife, but you could tell she wasn't a gold digger. I don't know how exactly I knew that, but I could tell she was emotionally invested in the dude and the kid she came for. She looked concerned, I guess. They tried the door, but it was locked. Had they kept quiet, I think they would have been fine, but one of them said something to the other, and the zombies below me heard. It didn't take long for them to shuffle around the corner of the building, and as soon as I saw the zombies moving, I started to yell. I screamed at them to get back inside their car and get the hell out. The woman did turn and start moving, but Hero Dad decided to beat some ass with that fucking bat. Let me tell you right now, bats are not that effective. I mean, if you're a rugged person and can swing it like a pro, yeah, sure, you can split some wigs, but not this guy. He clocked several of the zombies pretty good, but didn't get any headshots in. I kept yelling to hit them in the head, but he didn't change tactics in time. He kept hitting them in the sides and the arms, and, as you can imagine, it had no effect. It was as useful as trying to beat a tree into falling over. They swarmed him pretty quickly and collapsed on top of him. I could hear him scream as they ripped him apart, one bite at a time. Milfie had made her way back into the car, passenger side, where she started this fiasco. She must have dropped her purse, though, because she didn't start the car. Daddy Rich probably had his keys on him as well, so she was just as stuck as I was. Half of the zombies shuffled over after eating the dad and listlessly scratched at the windows of the car. I don't know if a zombie has the strength to break auto glass. I suspect a big one could, but I didn't get my answer that night. The other half of the zombies came back to the admissions building and returned to their incessant scratching, trying to get up at me and my skin again. That's how things settled for an hour or so. If I got right up to the edge of the roof nearest the road, I could watch Milfie in her car without being seen by the undead below. She cried a lot. The more I sat there, the more I started to realize she was really beautiful, and how sad everything was for her. It's like the fantasy that's always better than reality, I think. I wondered what her family life was like. I thought about which of the students her kid was. I fantasized about how the kid would hate how hot his mom was, and how hot his friends thought she was, and how much he would have hated that. It's how I passed the time for that hour. I really felt like I got to know her. I was totally shocked when she opened the door and got out. It was obviously suicide. I think she came to the conclusion that she had no more life left to live, and she just gave up. Can you blame her? One of the students, one of the nerdy ones, killed her. She just tilted her head back against the door frame of the car, and he ripped her throat out right where the Adam's apple would have been. She died pretty quickly, never put up an ounce of fight either. 
Her mind was made up the moment she got out. I hated to see her die like that, but you have to respect the will it must have taken to do what she did. I'm not condoning suicide, Mr. Journal, but there is some sense in what she did after what just happened to her and her family. I was genuinely sad to see her go. I actually was hoping to talk to her after we got to safety. Maybe in a way I was trying to rescue her like I didn't rescue Cassie. I felt really miserable after that woman from the car died. I felt even more miserable after her body got back up and started meandering around looking for something to eat, namely something like me. The rest of the night was spent laying as silently as possible on the roof of admissions. Eventually everyone who was capable of leaving campus was history, and I was left alone with no help anywhere to be found. My stomach was growling like you can't imagine, and I was really thirsty. At about the time of dawn when the eastern horizon takes on that faint bluish tinge, I remember I felt a little bit of optimism. Maybe I'd make it. I'd fallen in and out of sleep a few times that night, and I don't remember my dreams. I do know when I saw that horizon I was achy and my back was killing me. When I launched myself away from my mom at her elderly home earlier, I really smashed my back against the wall. Falling asleep on the roof did me no damn favors, so I got up to stretch. I walked around my little roof world and reassessed things. About ten zombies had walked off. I was happy to notice that when I shifted my weight and heard a loud crack under the shingles. I nearly dented my head when it dawned on me how retarded I was. I knelt down and, noise be damned, started ripping up shingles. Below the shingles was plain plywood. It was a gamble, but I felt the house inside was empty. If I could get through the roof and got inside, I would be one step closer to safety. I had no hammer, but the sword would work as a lever pretty good to pry up a sheet of the plywood. As quietly as I could, which wasn't very quiet at all, I pried up one edge of a sheet of plywood and got it torn up. That was loud, though, and by the time I had the wood up, I was fully surrounded by even more zombies than before. The crowd on the ground was at least three or four zombies deep now and surrounding half the building. Below the plywood was the ceiling, which was drywall. A few good hacks with the sword, though, and I cleared a space conveniently right above a desk. I started making noise inside the building to draw attention, but nothing came. I dropped down into the office and proceeded to clear the house and check the doors, empty and locked, respectively. The zombies were gathering outside en masse, though, so I needed to work quickly. As I said, the campus doors are strong, so that was going in my favor. Windows, though, were not. I had just watched a handful of the dead try and break car glass with no success, but regular window glass is a different animal altogether. I needed to get into a room with more security. Luckily, one of the back offices had only one small window and had a strong interior door. I checked one more thing before I began my plan for escape. The refrigerator. The staff fridge had two lunches from the day prior still in it, as well as some bottled water, and I started eating the crappy little sandwiches and gulping water as fast as I could. It reminds me of my military days. Eat as much as you can, as fast as you can. Worry about digestion later. I didn't know when my next meal was coming. New plan was this. Make a shitload of noise on one side of the admissions building, then run into my secure room after drawing them in. I would have to be really quick or really clever to get the majority of them inside the building with me. Open the small window, escape to a hopefully clearer exterior, get into my car somehow, get the rifle and more ammo for the pistol, possibly retrieve the shotgun as well, but that really seemed like reaching at the moment, and start doing some serious yard work on these fucking undead. No rest for the wicked. I implemented plan day after that day immediately. Well, that's not entirely true. I kept a small chunk of turkey from one sandwich for Otis. He needed something to eat badly, and I do not want anyone to think that I don't take good care of my cat. Love that guy. Talk to you soon, Mr. Journal. Adrian. Crime Incident Report Case number DRM062310-01 Month, June, Day 23 Year 2010 Day of Week, Wednesday Time, approximately 1625 Code section or description of incident Officer involved in fatal shooting Location of incident Moore's Sporting Goods, 1421 Riverside Way Victim or witness's name Daniel Roger McGreevy Address, 
14 Wilbur Street. Phone 499-555-3459. Height 6 foot 5 inches. Weight 265 pounds. Sex male. Eyes green. Hair none. Race Caucasian. ID type. Badge number 114. ID number 114. Issued March 8, 2004. Relation to victim subject. None. Arresting officer. Additional information. Vehicle. City Police Cruiser 06. Number of witnesses of crime incident. Six direct witnesses. One more on scene that heard incident. One more witness who returned to scene directly following. Names of witnesses and relevant info regarding. Direct witnesses are as follows. 1. Officer Daniel McGreevy. 2. Mike Damaris. 3. Robert Zwicky. 4. Benjamin Barnes. 5. David Johns, son of deceased. And 6. Philip Tompkins. Indirect witnesses inside business was 7. Gerald Moore, COP, retired. Witnesses 2, 3, 4, 6, and 7 are all employees of Moore's Sporting Goods. Witness 8 left scene before statement could be retrieved. Filing officer recognized witness as Adrian Ring. Place of attack, if applicable. Parking lot of Moore's Sporting Goods, north side, directly in front of customer entrance. Weapon used, if applicable. Filing officer discharged his service weapon twice at suspect. Weapon is a Glock 21, identified as property of City Police Department. Weapon ID number 22161. Suspect arrested, yes, no. Suspect was DOS. Suspect name, Paul Matthew Johns. Address, 11 Oak Ridge Boulevard, Mount Temple. Phone, 670-555-4141. Height, 5 foot 7 inches. Weight, 145 pounds. Sex, male. Eyes, brown. Hair, light brown. Race, Caucasian. ID type. OOS driver's license. ID number DL06 JSP41280. Additional information Vehicle 2009 Nissan Maxima XLE, Burgundy, Wine. OOS tags 14198S. Physical description of subject Subject exited vehicle wearing a light blue dress shirt and corduroy pants. Subject had a large blood stain spreading on his right forearm, appeared sweaty, in pain, and confused. His hair was disheveled, as was his general appearance. On closer inspection, he was found to be covered in fine mists of blood, similar to those found on attackers using blunt force trauma. Evidence collected at scene relevant to prosecution. No evidence was collected at the scene of the incident. Directly following the shooting, ambulances arrived, and the son, David Johns, entered into some form of seizure shock. He became physically aggressive and attacked witnesses as well as responding EMTs. The scene was cleared after that. Evidence collection would have resulted almost certainly in officer injury. Narrative A.O. was stationed at Moore's Sporting Goods for the day to ensure customer safety due to concerns regarding attacks on the general populace by sick, infected citizens. Store owner made the request to Chief Moore and instructed A.O. to station there. Majority of early afternoon was spent maintaining basic order and parking lot and keeping a visible presence to deter crimes against the business and its employees. A.O. neither witnessed nor intervened in any criminal activity. During afternoon, Chief of Police Moore instructed A.O. that any citizen that appeared injured and did not respond intelligently should be handled with extreme caution. The C.O.P. advised that deadly force was authorized if the A.O. felt that safety was a concern and if the injured was unresponsive to verbal commands. At approximately 16.25, the suspect arrived in Moore's parking lot driving at excessive speeds and recklessly. Suspect pulled into parking in such a dangerous fashion his vehicle nearly struck City Cruiser No. 06, as well as the A.O. A.O. then backed away, drew his service weapon, and instructed driver to exit the vehicle with his hands raised. At this time, the A.O. noticed the subject had a passenger in the front passenger seat of the vehicle. Passenger was later identified as David Johns, the suspect's son. The suspect exited the vehicle and started walking towards the A.O., ignoring all verbal commands. Behind the AO, the Moore's employees were getting dangerously close to the unresponsive suspect. 
A.O. knew that the employees were legally armed and wanted to take control of the situation before it escalated into a multi-person firefight. A.O. then visually confirmed that the suspect had an injury. The right-hand sleeve at the forearm location was covered in fresh red blood and appeared to be a bite wound. At that point, the A.O. decided that being bitten, as well as unresponsive, combined with directly approaching the A.O., ignoring all officer commands, authorized deadly force, given the prior instructions by the C.O.P. The officer cleared his lines of fire to ensure the passenger was safe and that the subject had no one behind him that could be hit by any rounds missing and or passing through. Once cleared, the officer discharged his service weapon five times into the center mass of the subject, whereupon he collapsed in the parking lot directly in front of suspect's vehicle. The officer observed the subject for some time and identified that the subject was dead. After ensuring the subject was dead, the A.O. made the decision to shoot the subject one additional time in the head to fully ensure death. With media reports and police reports earlier in the day instructing those in danger to shoot or damage the brain, the A.O. wanted to ensure further public safety and took the extra step. This course of action later proved invaluable as the son, David Johns, was bitten, entered into some form of seizure, shock, and became violent. It is quite possible that the suspect would have done the same thing were he not shot in the head. A.O. notified emergency response units and the C.O.P., who responded almost immediately. Charges filed or to be filed. Threatening an officer, assaulting a peace officer, resisting arrest, reckless operation, endangering the welfare of a child. Additional notes not related to incident, if any. A.O. McGreevy is leaving town. I am gathering all my things and heading three towns over to my mother's home. You can reach me there if needed, assuming we even do an investigation any further. I think the State Internal Affairs Department is going to be a little swamped with all these attacks. Good luck to whoever reads this, and God bless. November 4th Hey, Mr. Journal, how's life? Mine is fucking phenomenal. OMG, I almost totally, like, fucking died today. Lols, that's super leet. Sarcasm font off. Vigilance and attention to detail. I used to preach that shit at work all the time, my whole friggin' life. Uh, attention to detail, uh, attention to detail, vigilance. I cannot cut corners any time I am out of Hall E anymore. I am so furious at myself right now, I can barely type. In fact... Fuck this. I have to calm down. Adrian. November 4th. Second entry. Much better now. Let me dial this back a little bit and rehash why I was so pissed off and all roid ragey earlier at myself. I went to the campus cafeteria this afternoon to get some canned food and move it here to Hall E. I was running low on a few different things, was jonesing for a bit of variety, and I haven't yet moved all the supplies into here, so it was a pretty standard food run. We're talking a hundred yards from door to door. I've checked the campus twice a day for weeks now, I think, making sure nothing is here. I mean, shit, why would anything be here anyway? I make little to no noise, I stay inside as much as possible, I give those motherfuckers no reason at all to come up here. Apparently, I need to rethink my whole vision of how and why these things move about, because one of them made his way onto campus and all the way into the friggin' cafeteria. So, I always do my errands during daylight hours. As you may have gleaned from my prior entries here, Mr. Journal, I do not operate at night. Clever guy that I am, I use the campus maintenance four-wheeler to get around when I need to move a lot of things. It has a little trailer that can be hooked up to it, which makes moving heavy things, or lots of little things, a lot faster and safer. Plus, if shit hits the fan, I could peace out like a Girl Scout, and regroup somewhere safer. I keep the ATV ten paces from the door of Hall E for convenience. Hopped on, fired it up, and motored over to the cafeteria at a leisurely pace. Now, when I do my little patrols, I always bring the SIG, one of the swords, and the bow. I use them in the exact opposite order listed should something happen. As I said, I believe noise is really bad and draws them in. The bow and sword are both silent, so it suits me and my plan. Today was no different. I rolled over to the cafeteria, parked at the kitchen door, which is on the side as opposed to the main entrance the kids would have used during the school hours. Staff never used the main doors at night, as we primarily would be going there to raid the fridges to feed ourselves. SOP, as they say. Hopped off the quad, grabbed my banana box out of the trailer, unlocked the kitchen door, and moved in like any other day. 
Now, right inside the kitchen door, you enter a short hall, and there's the walk-in cooler and walk-in freezer. Opposite those two doors in the hall was the area we used to call the honey hole, where they kept staff-only food. All the good shit, basically. It meant all the food I needed was within 15 feet of the back door. Now, the electricity has long since been off in this building, and that means the cooler and freezer are offline. If you've ever had your electricity go off for any time, you probably know that frequently the fridge can get pretty warm all on its own, especially after any food inside it begins rotting. The freezer stayed cold for quite some time, which was awesome, but the cooler was basically a total loss within a week. Fresh veggies didn't keep, rotted, warmed the cooler, lather, rinse, repeat. So I walked into Honey Hole and started my shopping spree. I filled up the banana box and brought it outside, transferred everything into the trailer and brought it inside again. By the way, if you're curious, yes, it's that banana box. Same one, still kicking like kung fu. I'm telling you, if you are not on the banana box team, get on it now. Anyway, I went back inside for a second food run and filled the box again. I continued humming the Linkin Park song I had stuck in my head and casually turned to bring load two out. When I turned, I bumped into the goddamn zombie. Have you ever been truly scared? I don't mean like when you watch a freaky movie and that makes you not want the lights off at night. I mean like when someone catches you off guard and your heart leaps into your throat. You get that immediate single pound of the heart in the sudden surge of adrenaline. Usually about one second later, whoever scared you is laughing because of the look on your face, and then you either smack the shit out of them for scaring you, or you're laughing with them. You know what I'm talking about, right? This was like that, sans laughter. I nearly had a heart attack on the spot and immediately went on the defensive. I was already in the corner of the pantry, so I had nowhere to go, and this thing was already pressing against the banana box, which weighed a solid 50 pounds by that time. It was filled with cans. Only way to get rid of it was to drop it, which would put it right on my foot, or shove it at the zombie. The zombie was so close, he had the initiative. Now, they aren't fast, but they can lunge like a fucking pro when they have you like that. This guy was on me like white on rice. He sort of came down with both hands and knocked the box free right onto my feet. Fortunately, it landed on my feet and not my toes. It hurt like a bitch, but as we all know, toe pain is the worst. Foot pain, much more tolerable. Now, the box falling on my feet sent me backwards, and I hit the wall pretty hard. The friggin' zombie kind of fell onto me and bit me pretty good. Yeah, I know, I said the B word. Curtains for Adrian, right? No way, no how, Mr. Journal. Adrian gets lucky again. The zombie sunk every last tooth into the collar of the fleece jacket I had on. The fucker's weight on me took me all the way to the ground, cornered on the floor with a zombie on top of me biting the fuck out of my collar. God hell, he smelt the high heaven. I flat out do not know how I didn't smell him coming. Maybe I was used to the smell of the wretched freezer in the kitchen and just tuned it out. I don't know. Anyway, I look at it. I'm a fucking idiot. So panic time. I've got a few years of jujitsu and karate under my belt, so I'm fairly good in a scrap. I'm not a ninja, mind you, but, you know, I could give a ninja a fucking hell of a bloody nose if one tangled with me. I think I gave the zombie a sweeping elbow right to the jaw and dislodged him from my coat. He didn't fly off me, but he got his mouth off me and shifted his weight enough so I could slide my hips sideways and get a leg under his body. I kicked out and up and tossed him like a fucking rag doll about three feet. I used the wall and scrambled to my feet while the dead guy got back up. I didn't want to waste a bullet, so I yanked the sword out and sunk it into his rotting melon head with an overhead swipe. His head came apart like an eggshell filled with rotting cauliflower. Goddamn horrid. If I couldn't smell him before that, I sure as shit could then. It was horrible. I almost puked but choked it down. After a few dry heaves, I checked the whole building and cleared it. Empty. All the doors were shut, too, which meant this guy had been here all along, and I missed him when I cleared it months ago. Or he had the mental ability to pull open a door. Fuck me. I've never seen one that smart. Usually, when presented with a door that doesn't push open, they just press against it until something gets their attention elsewhere. This changes things. I'm really hoping that it was scenario A, and I'm just an idiot that made a mistake. 
Because if it's scenario B, then I need to really rethink where dangerous places are. I haven't locked any of the campus buildings that have doors that pull out or have knobs or latches. They haven't figured any of that out any time I've been observing them. Fucking A, man. Tomorrow I am going to every building here on campus and locking the doors. That really irks the shit out of me, too. I don't want to have to fumble with keys if I'm in a situation. I've seen it so many times it's a goddamn cliché. Right up there with cars not starting when the killer's chasing you and that the pretty girl always falls when being chased. Fumbling with keys. Awesome. Can't wait for that to happen. Mark my words, Mr. Journal. It will happen. I know my luck. Okay, Mr. Journal. Moral of this story is attention to detail and vigilance. Till all the buildings are fully locked, I clear every single one of them as if I was expecting a zombie to be inside. Further... Any time I'm moving anywhere outside of Hall E, I will increase my vigilance and stop humming. Furthermore, every room must pass the sniff test. In other good news, the zombie had 350 bucks in his wallet. That'll come in handy. <sighs> Adrian. November 6th. The campus has been locked down. Took me all of yesterday to check every unlocked building fully, but it's done. I didn't find anything in any of those buildings, which doesn't prove or disprove anything. I hate this not knowing bullshit. I wish the radio would spark up and say something one of these days. It's been silent for a very long time. I only turn it on at night for an hour or two, just in case now. I honestly don't think I'm ever going to get any answers to the big questions. All I can hope to do is get enough info for my own observations around here to form enough of an intelligent opinion to make good choices. The consequences for making a single bad choice could be staggering. It's obvious enough, but there's fuck all I can do about it. That's not entirely true. I could try to find more people. Hooking up with more folks who have survived this long might be a good thing. After all, they have to be reasonably able and intelligent to have made it, and it's got to be a good thing. Plus, they might have information that will improve my situation. It's not like I don't have a ton of space up here. I could easily house 150 people here without giving up one inch of my own space. Feeding them would be a problem, though. Huh. Good for thought. Yesterday and today thus far have been pretty mundane since the scare of a lifetime in the kitchen. The clearing of the buildings turned out to be a pointless pain in the ass, as opposed to a dangerous string of encounters. I'll grant you, it felt dangerous as hell, and reminded me of kicking in doors in Iraq, but it turned out to be nothing. Thank God for the little things, I guess. I figured I'd use this entry to reminisce over the day that I started to clear this joint out. June 24th was the date, as I recall. A rough day in my history book. Mr. Journal, I think the last thing I talked about was how I hacked my way inside the admissions building via the roof and finally got some food. I scarfed down a couple of sandwiches and a bottle or three of water out of the little staff fridge. I found a good office that had a single window and a strong door— and the plan was to make a shitload of noise at the entrance to the building, somehow get them to come into said building, scramble to the office, and theoretically trap the majority of the zombie horde surrounding the building inside the above-mentioned building. All of this while simultaneously avoiding being devoured by my former students, co-workers, and random family members. Genius, right? I'm sure you can predict how foolproof the plan turned out to be. So, over the night, I became positive that these things went to noise like moths to flame. Every time I stayed silent, they started to drift off. Any time there was a noise, they moved towards it. I knew I needed a noisemaker. In Amy's little office, I knew she had one of those little radio CD players on a file cabinet. I grabbed it, moved it to the office I planned on falling back to, plugged it in, and cranked it to ten. Noisemaker established and ready to make noise, I went to the lobby area and started banging on the windows and hollering. It reminded me so much of that scene in one Romero zombie movie where the guys are yelling in the department store trying to get the zombies to come to the window. I mean, freakishly the same. Enough that I actually found myself laughing just like them. I mean, it was laughter or tears at this stage. No sense in crying at this point. I ripped the curtains down to increase visibility as well. It seemed to work almost instantly. That side of admissions had remained pretty empty of the dead since Milfi and husband got killed, and within seconds of yanking the curtains, the windows were full of zombies, three deep out into the yard. 
They pressed against the glass desperately, mouths opening and closing reflexively, filthy hands leaving streaks of brown and red blood and flesh. One of the windows cracked loudly under the pressure, and I got the answer to my glass question. I did have a huge moment of genius right then, though. I grabbed the curtains and stuffed them under the back edge of the front door. Enough blockage to trip them up when they opened the door, which might give me enough time to safely get to the office I had set up. I remember psyching myself up real quick before the glass broke again, and I cracked the door open. The door surged inward maybe four or five inches immediately, and the curtains hung it up perfectly. I didn't wait to gauge any further success, and got the fuck back to the office. I remember hearing the door creak further open as I slammed the office door shut behind me. Within seconds they were pressing against the interior door, and it started to rattle and vibrate in the door jam. I had no idea how long it would hold against them. My heart was throbbing up into my neck. I was so jacked on adrenaline. My mouth was bone dry. Man, what a rush. I hit play on the CD player to fully set my trap, and Lady Gaga burst forth. A little bit of me died right then. I'm not saying she sucks or anything. I just think she's a tad bit overplayed. Flavor of the month, if you will. That's not a pun regarding her likely fate as zombie food somewhere out there, either. You know, I actually take that back. I really do think she sucks. Sorry to offend you, Mr. Journal, but I've got to stick to my guns on this. So, I pushed the desk over against the door as best I could, but the closest I could get it was about three or four inches. There was a bookcase and a fire extinguisher on the walls that prevented me from getting it flush. Hopefully, if the door gave in, the desk would trip them up. I yelled at the top of my lungs along with Lady Gaga for the better part of a song before I started to get a bad feeling for the door's integrity and my nerves. I peeked out the small window, saw it was clear behind the building, and slid it open quietly. I'll tell you this, hearing that door rattle so violently with all those zombies just on the other side was creepy as old man balls. Mind you, they make no noise. The zombies. I can't vouch for old man balls. So... It was just the violent shaking of the door in the frame with a slowly building rotten stench behind it. There was no audible malice on the other side, just this sinister, silent hunger. Freaky shit. Plan was this at that point. Escape via window, slip around in a wide circle to my car, if it was clear enough, get my twenty-two and some 9mm ammo, and then find a decent place to start killing zombies. 